This happened to me about two years ago, before I started working at a law firm in Savannah, Georgia. My name's Benjamin Eldridge, but people call me Benji. I'd enrolled in a camping trip with some acquaintances from my former job, hoping to make friends since I was new to the area. To avoid tourist spots, we decided to venture into Pine Barrens, a vast forest reserve on the East Coast. It was a sunny day when we gathered at the trailhead, our backpacks full of gear and high spirits overflowing. We'd been walking for hours when we stumbled on an old shack with words carved into the door panel. Leave or die. The sight sent shivers down my spine, and some of us chuckled nervously. Despite some feeling uneasy, our group leader, Clarissa Fairchild, reassured us that it was probably a prank. Further into the forest, we were hit by an overpowering stench that made my stomach churn. As we walked closer to the source of the smell, we discovered a gutted deer hanging from a tree branch intestines dripping down like bullwhips. Most of our group hesitated. Some wanted to leave while others argued that it smelled worse than it looked. Quit freaking out, scoffed Emery Sullivan as he fingered his pocket knife. It's just an animal carcass. But I couldn't shake off the feeling that something sinister was lurking in those trees. Night fell, and it was around nine o'clock when Edwin Dracos had finished setting up camp, including roaring fire and space for our tents. We cooked dinner over the flames, but laughter around the campfire came to a halt after Emery remembered his missing camera from earlier in the day. I've got to find it, he insisted stubbornly. Reluctantly, Frederick Clark suggested hiking back and looking for it together with Emery. So they went off with their flashlights, while the rest of us remained at camp, not keen to venture further into the forest after nightfall. Time went by, and the crackling fire became the only noise in an otherwise silent night. I was dozing off when a blood-curdling scream pierced the air, jolting me to my feet. One torch shone through the trees, illuminating Emery stumbling towards us as Frederick's scream echoed through the air. Help! Panic raced through our group. Clarissa quickly tried to call for help but realized we had no cell service. We held our breath, waiting for Frederick or any sound. Emery gasped, his face pale. There's, there's something out there. It got Frederick. A sinking feeling made my hands tremble as we huddled together around the dying fire, knowing that we might be next. Then it happened. I saw them. First one silhouette in the tree line carrying a gnarled wooden club bigger than any of us. Then another emerging nearby gripping a crude spear. Men or things that resembled men stalked towards us with deliberate steps as we stared in shock. Run! screamed Clarissa at last. Petrified but determined to live, I sprinted aimlessly into Pine Barren's darkened depths behind the others, desperately longing for safety and silently praying for escape from something far worse than an urban legend. The grim race for survival continued as monstrous shapes tore after us through thorny bushes, closing in on my every exhale and inching closer with every step. I couldn't believe what I was seeing, cannibalistic mountain men, approaching us with murderous intent. The situation seemed hopeless, but my survival instinct kicked in, and I raced after Clarissa, Emery, and the others into the darkness of Pine Barrens. We ran blindly, hoping to put as much distance between us and our pursuers as possible. Branches slapped at our faces and thorns tore at our clothes. With each passing minute, I felt exhaustion creeping in, but the sounds of those horrific mountain men grew ever closer. As we continued our desperate flight, I racked my brain for any ideas on how to escape. Our lack of cell service had made it impossible to call for help. With every gasping breath and pounding heartbeat, I wished for some way to contact the outside world. 
Our group moved together through the darkness, driven by adrenaline and fear. But despite our best efforts, one by one, we began losing touch with one another. Clarissa's screams pierced the air as she was caught by one of our attackers, her fate sealed. I pushed through the pain in my legs and lungs as I stumbled upon a hiding place, a fallen tree with a hollowed-out trunk large enough to curl up inside. Without thinking twice, I squeezed myself in there and held my breath as best I could. Time stretched out infinitely as I hid inside that tree trunk, heart pounding in my ears, listening for any signs of our pursuers. At one point, their heavy footsteps drew dangerously close, yet they seemed unable to find me within the dark confines of my sanctuary. Eventually, dawn began to break. Despite my fear that leaving the tree might mean running right into the arms of a waiting mountain man, I knew it was also a chance to get help. The sunlight filtered through the trees as I silently crept from my hiding place. The woods were eerily quiet now that all the chaos had died down, and I hoped that meant our attackers had left the area. Not wanting to take chances, I climbed a nearby tree to get a better view of my surroundings before moving on. From up high, I spotted a nearby road winding through the forest. With renewed determination, I carefully climbed down and made my way towards it. As I walked along the road, I flagged down a passing car, desperately hoping that the driver would be willing to help. As luck would have it, the man behind the wheel was a local police officer who believed my terror-filled account without hesitation. Grateful for his intervention, I guided him back to where our terrifying ordeal had begun. We discovered the remains of Clarissa and Frederick in a grisly scene. Their bodies had been brutally mutilated, carved up like animals by those sickening mountain men. Although horrified by the sight, I knew deep down that sharing their fate would have been mine if not for my narrow escape. The officer called for backup, and a full-scale investigation was launched into this unthinkable incident. The authorities tracked down the remaining members of our group. Those who had survived found solace in one another as we pieced together what had happened. Together, we learned just how close we'd come to becoming the prey in these brutal mountain men's twisted hunting game. Shaken by all that had transpired, we mourned the loss of Clarissa and Frederick, horrified by their gruesome deaths at hands of these sadistic predators. Although we were able to help lead law enforcement to uncover and arrest some of these cannibalistic mountain men hiding deep within pine barrens, not all were caught. It's likely that many will never face justice for their heinous crimes. As I look back on that harrowing night, I'm thankful for having escaped alongside some of my friends, though heartbroken at those we lost along the way. The terror-filled events that took place in Pine Barrens will forever haunt our memories, serving as a chilling reminder of how quickly a fun adventure can turn deadly. This happened to me three summers ago when I decided to visit Appalachia for a hiking trip. I was looking forward to escaping city life for a while. Tired of being cooped up in my apartment, I booked a cabin in a small town called Pine Ridge, near a trail that promised beautiful views and challenging terrain. I'm Jack Preston, a bank employee from Delaware who needed this break. During the day, I'd take long hikes, and at night, I'd unwind by campfires and conversations with the locals at the town bar people like Jim Foster, a cheerful truck driver, and Emily Watkins, a kind-hearted waitress. They made the place feel like home. It was about the fourth day into my trip when I stumbled upon something gruesome. While hiking down a less-traveled trail, I discovered a human arm half-buried under some rocks. The sight almost made me sick. Panicking, but trying to keep calm, 
I decided against yelling for help because I didn't want to attract any unwanted attention. Instead, I headed back to Pine Ridge to inform Sheriff Melinda Mitchell of my horrifying discovery. Offering her assistance in investigating further, we returned to the scene together. Little did I know that it would set off a chain of events that would lead me into the depths of pure terror. As Melinda and I picked our way back to where I found the severed arm, we noticed signs of other disturbances broken branches and trampled bushes that hinted at violent struggles. Throughout this day-long investigation, we felt increasingly uneasy as though watched by an unseen observer. Evening snuck in as we searched for more clues or even an abandoned campsite belonging to whoever had done this horrific act. Feeling drained from the day's events, we decided to turn back when we heard an ominous crack echoing through the darkness. We froze. Our hearts pounded as fear crawled up our spines. Seconds later, a blood-curdling scream pierced the air, followed by distant footsteps swiftly approaching us. We instinctively ran. Dodging trees and navigating the rocky terrain, we spotted a makeshift shack down in the valley. Thinking it might be a safe refuge, we rushed inside. The dimly lit space reeked of decay fresh blood stains covering the floor and walls. This was no safe haven. It was their lair. Emerging from the shadows, a group of thin, disheveled men surrounded us, almost indistinguishable one to another. Their smiles were cold. Hunger appeared in their eyes as they stared at us like predators about to pounce on their prey. These mountain men were cannibals, feasting on whatever unlucky travelers who stumbled into their territory. They had remained anonymous and evaded capture by living in seclusion, hiding under everyone's radar in Pine Ridge. In that horrific moment, I knew better than to call for help. Our screams would only entice them further. We had bumbled straight into the lion's den. Sheriff Melinda and I exchanged panicked glances too terrified even to consider our options for fear of losing precious seconds. It had been such a beautiful morning when I first set off on my hike. And now here we were, trapped in this nightmare scenario with no idea how we ended up here or if we could ever escape. As the cannibals closed around us like a tightening noose, my mind raced backward from this dark spiral into our descent from paradise just a few hours ago before everything started down this path. Melinda's voice shook with fear as she said, Jack, I think I see a way out. I followed Melinda's gaze and saw a small opening in the wall that, had it not been for the thin beam of sunlight penetrating it, might have remained hidden forever. Without waiting another second, we darted towards the opening, hands scraping against the rough stones covering it up. As we squeezed ourselves through the narrow passage, I could hear low guttural growls echoing from behind us. The cannibals were not going to let their next meals slip away that easily. The passage seemed endless, and as we scrambled over rocks and twisted roots in a blind panic, I couldn't help but wonder if it would lead us to an even more horrifying fate. Finally, after what felt like hours of navigating the seemingly never-ending tunnel, a tiny glimmer of light up ahead offered hope. Bursting out into open air and sunshine was such a relief that I nearly collapsed out of sheer gratitude. But there was no time to rest. We had to keep moving, because as I glanced over my shoulder, I saw those vile creatures emerging from the darkness like bloodthirsty ghouls. They're still after us. I yelled over my shoulder to Melinda as we ran down Pine Ridge towards civilization. We need to find a phone or someone who can help. No sooner had I spoken those words than a pickup truck came into view up ahead. A man in his fifties, clad in worn jeans and flannel shirts, stepped out of the truck, surveying his surroundings for any signs of danger. Help! Melinda yelled between breaths. Please, you've got to help us. 
There are cannibals chasing us. The man looked skeptical at first but took one look at our blood-stained clothes and panicked expressions before ushering us into his truck without hesitation. I think there's a police station just down this road, he said as he slammed on the accelerator pedal. I glanced back through the rear window, fretting over the creatures that had been pursuing us. We arrived at the police station haphazardly spilling out of the truck and rushing inside while our newfound ally parked his vehicle. Inside, we relayed what had happened, hands shaking and voices quivering as we recounted our tale of horror escaping Pine Ridge. The officers listened attentively, but I could see doubt in their eyes. Who could blame them? Our story was something straight out of a nightmare. Regardless, a search party eventually was sent out with us in tow to trace our steps back to the cannibal's lair. With rifles loaded and flashlights scanning the darkness, this time accompanied by a slew of armed professionals, we ventured deep into Pine Ridge once more. We found the underground chamber eerily empty, or at least it seemed so until we discovered several hidden passages sprawling like spider webs beneath Pine Ridge the perfect escape route for those damnable cannibals, who must have heard sirens approaching and managed to scurry away like rats in the night. In that horrifying lair, we found evidence supporting our claims stacked high, bones picked clean of flesh, belongings stripped from their deceased owners and trinkets taken as souvenirs. Melinda and I managed to survive our traumatizing encounter with those ravenous mountain men. The police kept an eye out for any suspicious activity up in Pine Ridge, in hopes that one day they'd be able to capture these monsters responsible for so much suffering. All this changed Melinda. The once shining sheriff became uneasy on patrol at night, forever haunted by those cold ravenous eyes looming just beyond sight. Me? I locked away all memories of that cursed hike and took solace in knowing that no matter how difficult life became from that day forth, at least it would always be better than what fate had planned for me back on Pine Ridge with those cannibalistic creatures. The brutal murder ceased, but the fear of those lost souls who may have suffered horrendous deaths still lingers in our hearts. Pine Ridge will never be the same for any of us in this tight-knit community and we mourn. To this day, we remember each of those who were taken from us, innocent victims of a monstrous appetite born in the shadows of twisted folklore. This happened to me a few summers ago when I decided to take a solo hiking trip in the Appalachian Mountains. I took a deep breath, inhaling the crisp pine-scented air as I embarked on my adventure. The excitement of the trail ahead had me feeling like a kid again. I overheard some fellow hikers whispering about an old folklore that today I still think was utterly ridiculous, although it did plant fear in my heart for a brief moment. My name is Clive Norwood. I'm a college student working part-time as a waiter at a pizza joint in my hometown. Hiking has always been my escape from everyday life, but this time was different. The trail had led me deep into the vast serenity of the forest. A few hours into my hike, I came across a peculiar feature, a side trail that appeared to be recently formed. Quirky messages were carved into the fallen trees alongside this makeshift path, egging me to explore further. After walking for an hour off track, I met an unusual group of forestry workers struggling with their equipment. Philo Mercer, Olivia Caulfield, and Hamish Bradbear introduced themselves and asked if I needed any help. They mentioned they were investigating strange happenings in the area but didn't elaborate on their work. As we exchanged small talk, we suddenly heard agonizing screams from somewhere nearby. Unsure how to react, the group merely exchanged nervous glances. We all shared the consensus to follow the noise, 
hoping whoever needed our help had cell phone signal because none of us could make calls from where we stood. Heading deeper into the unfamiliar terrain while calling out made us feel somewhat vulnerable yet somewhat courageous too. We stumbled upon bloody footprints leading towards what seemed like an intermittent campsite with traces of struggle and havoc lingering in the air. At this point, reality settled in. We understood that something horrendous had occurred. The subtle dread within our group had grown, amplifying the tense atmosphere surrounding us. Each crunch of leaves or snap of twigs added to the cacophony that fed our fear. We split up, hoping to cover more ground and find any clues on what could have transpired. I found myself with Hamish, who shared his family's story about their farm going bankrupt and needing to take a job within the tracking team. As we continued searching, we spotted an improvised wooden trap hole filled with sharpened sticks holding a lifeless body disfigured by puncture wounds. Overcome with horror, I couldn't help but let out a retching sound. With no time to waste and barely any sunlight left, we regrouped with Philo and Olivia. Each recounted their own grotesque discoveries before deciding to cut through the forest to reach a ranger station for help. But it wasn't long before shadows maneuvered between the trees, deepening in size and scope until they revealed their ungodly forms cannibalistic mountain men standing with an eerie poise as they blocked our path ahead. Their mammoth build combined with crude weapons carved from the forest itself invoked primal fears in all of us. The first savage lunge for Hamish, ripping through flesh with bone-crushing force as my comrade groaned in unbearable pain. In any other situation, laughter would have been inconceivable. But at that moment Philo cracked a joke about our attacker's abysmal table manners, a delirious attempt to keep his sanity intact as he fumbled for his hunting knife amid chaos. Philo's hysterical laughter snapped me back to the horrific reality of our situation. The mountain men closed in on us, their grotesque faces twisted into expectant grins. This was no time for jokes, we needed a plan. Olivia, having heard the commotion on our walkie-talkie and realizing the ranger station was still too far away for help to arrive in time, shouted, We need cover! Get to those trees! We darted into the forest, leaving the mortally injured Hamish behind as he was unable to move. I could hear him screaming for mercy as one of the savage cannibals tore through his leg. We had no choice but to push onward seeking safety among the trees while hunted by these monstrous men. The forest became narrower and darker with each passing second, but adrenaline flowed through our veins. Philo managed to contact a nearby search and rescue team before realizing that their ETA would be far too late for us. We don't have much time. Let's find a hiding spot, he exclaimed. As we searched for an adequate hiding place, I couldn't help but feel guilty for Hamish. The disastrous turn of events had turned us all into prey for these abhorrent monsters who seemed to find joy in our suffering. At last, we found a hollowed-out tree large enough to hide in. We quickly scrambled inside and tried our best not to make a sound as we heard our pursuers approaching. The monstrous leader of this twisted pack stalked closest to where we hid. His vicious grin revealed sharpened teeth lined with fresh blood, Hamish's blood most likely. His knotted beard served as a makeshift nest for bugs that crawled all over him. It wasn't long before he began talking with his underlings in guttural, animalistic tones that told us our frantic running had led them straight toward us. They seemed certain they could still catch us, and that certainty seemed justified as long as we were trapped in this forest with them. As we hid, Olivia whispered to us, Listen, I have a plan. This is a long shot, but our best chance to survive. We need to light a fire behind us while we escape. It will slow them down, maybe even drive them out of the forest. 
With no better alternatives at hand, we all nodded in agreement. Emerging from our hiding place, Philo used his lighter to ignite a small pile of dry leaves nearby. As the fire spread and advanced towards us, we could only hope it would remain controlled enough to keep them at bay. We continued onward as the heat grew on our backs and heard the enraged cries of the mountain men discovering their hunting ground being set ablaze. Their pursuit grew more erratic, probably caught between chasing their prey and ensuring their home didn't burn down. Our terrified sprint was soon accompanied by the shrill blare of approaching helicopters. Help was finally near. Knowing that rescue was within reach offered us some hope that we might escape these woods alive. Emerging from the dense trees, we found ourselves sprinting across a wide open field just as search and rescue helicopters began touching down nearby. We waved and screamed for help as another team on ATVs came rushing in to cover the remaining distance. The mountain men had halted at the edge of the forest, unwilling or unable to pursue further. The sight of armed authorities seemed to have given them second thoughts about their relentless chase. For once today, luck seemed to be on our side. We were quickly loaded into an ambulance where medical personnel checked our injuries and offered reassurance that we'd be safe. From there, we were taken to a nearby hospital where friends and family awaited our arrival. Over the following days, I couldn't stop replaying those horrifying events in my head. Hamish's screams haunted my every waking moment, and I mourned the loss of a man who only wanted to provide for his family. Then... There was the story Philo shared with members from the press. The entire ordeal had featured on local and national news. Frightened residents who'd long balked at the terrifying legends were now demanding action. We were survivors, not heroes. We'd simply escaped something unimaginable to become living proof of the carnage that existed in those woods. Warnings would be given— and we could only hope that our story would prevent others from suffering as we did. This happened to me about a decade ago. I was driving with my friend, Hank Jessup, to a remote cabin in the Appalachian Mountains of Virginia for a weekend getaway. The cabin belonged to a friend of his named Jedediah Smith. We thought it would be the perfect spot to escape city life for a few days. As we approached our destination, the winding mountain roads turned treacherous. I carefully navigated each turn as dense fog rolled in, reducing our visibility significantly. The narrowed road made me feel even more on edge. We arrived at the cabin by nightfall. It was an old wooden structure hidden within lush forests, and an eerie silence filled the air. It lacked modern conveniences like electricity or running water, but we were prepared with battery-powered lanterns and plenty of bottled water. The next day, we decided to explore the area and enjoy nature's beauty. We wandered through tall trees and dense foliage until we stumbled upon a trail that led deeper into the mountains. Feeling adventurous, we decided to follow it. Several hours in, we discovered something disturbing, a bloody, torn-up shirt that appeared relatively fresh. Unsettled, we considered turning back but curiosity got the better of us. We continued on. As we ventured further into the mountains, we found more articles of clothing and discarded possessions, all blood-stained and deserted. Uneasiness crept in as I recalled Jedediah's warning against wandering too far from the cabin. Soon after that realization, we started hearing soft rustling sounds in the distance that quickly turned into faint grunting noises. They didn't sound like an animal or anything familiar. Hank held on to his pocket knife tightly as if sensing immediate danger. The guttural noises were getting louder and scarier by the minute as they seemed to draw closer from behind us. Maybe it's just some crazy redneck out here playing games, 
Hank murmured nervously. We laughed quietly, trying to calm our nerves. We decided to head back, retracing our steps along the unfamiliar terrain. As dusk approached, we came across another unsettling sight, a body of what seemed to be a hiker brutally mutilated, his limbs scattered around. Our panic increased as we realized we were being hunted. I reached for my phone, but there was no signal. It was useless. In that moment, I recalled my father's advice from years ago. There are some things you can't outrun, only outsmart. I quickly devised a plan to disorient our unknown assailants using Hank's pocket knife and our lanterns. We managed to create an elaborate trap while avoiding being detected. Just as we were about to move forward, our crude alarm system made of branches was triggered by something large and heavy making its way towards us. Terrified at this point, we hid behind a nearby bush and watched as a group of large, disfigured men emerged from the darkness. Their eyes gleamed hungrily in the dim light of the lanterns as they approached the trap cautiously. The grotesque beings were unlike any human beings we had ever encountered. They were missing fingers, had overly long arms, and appeared emaciated with sunken eyes. It dawned on me then that these were the cannibalistic mountain men that locals whispered about although I never imagined they could be so terrifying. As the mountain men closed in on our trap, it became clear that there was more than one group of them. They communicated through grunts and gestures as if attempting to strategize against us. Sweat poured down my face as I sensed it was just a matter of time before they discovered our hiding spot. Just when it felt like all hope might be lost, Hank motioned towards our rigged trap. One of them had stepped into the noose that suspended him above ground. We seized that opportunity to bolt from our hiding spot, racing towards the cabin as the other mountain men pursued us. The guttural shrieks of rage echoed through the forest, driving us to run faster despite our exhaustion. Pushing us to limits we never knew we had, we sprinted onward, hoping we were outpacing our monstrous pursuers. Our hearts pounded as we charged ahead it was clear that there could only be two outcomes, survival or death. We continued our frantic sprint towards the cabin, the mountain men's enraged snarls fueling our adrenaline. When we reached the cabin, I scrambled to shove a heavy bookshelf in front of the door. Hank dialed 911, his hands shaking as he relayed our location to the visibly disbelieving operator. One of our friends, Lucy, peeked through a crack in the window. She whispered that there were four more mountain men gathering outside, their faces contorted with anger and bloodlust. Why they didn't try to force their way into our haven remained a mystery. Night fell and still no police arrived. It seemed the remoteness of our location was taking its toll on response time. We tried contacting our friends who had gone into town earlier that day, but reception was non-existent. As darkness consumed the landscape, we heard a scream. It was Sarah one of the cannibalistic mountain men had grabbed her through an open window. Without thinking about our own safety, we rushed to help her and managed to fight off her attacker, but not without consequence. As she fell back into our arms, we noticed the damage— a deep gash on her arm exposed flesh and bone. Seeing Sarah in pain fueled angry determination within us. We needed to survive and hold out until help arrived. When morning finally broke through, bringing with it no sign of rescue or relenting from our adversaries, we knew it was up to us to escape this nightmare alive. It was then that Hank remembered his uncle kept rifles locked away in a storage shed nearby. Dividing responsibilities between us some gathered food from the kitchen while others barricaded weaker points within the cabin Hank and I carefully ventured to retrieve the firearms. Shaking hands muffled by heavy sweat hindered my ability to wind the open lock back around its latch. Glancing over at Hank, whose focused expression suggested trouble focusing on the task at hand, 
It was clear he shared these nerves. The sound of snapping twigs broke our concentration. A mountain man was nearing our hiding place. Thinking fast, we picked up a metal shovel and slammed the man's head with it, knocking him unconscious. We reunited with our friends in the cabin equipped with rifles and ammunition. This simple alteration to the power dynamic present in our horrifying conflict had renewed our dwindling hope. As we prepared to leave, Lucy spotted a police car approaching the cabin from afar. It seemed that despite how weak her call for help may have sounded, somehow it had found a target willing to investigate. Guns raised as we exited the cabin, scanning the immediate vicinity for any potential threats. Apprehensive law enforcement officers remained at a safe distance, clearly startled by the nightmarish environment that awaited them. As we recounted our tales, one cop said there had been multiple reports recently of cannibalistic mountain men sightings. He apologized for not taking Hank's earlier call more seriously. Huddled together under the blankets in an emergency shelter a short distance away, we mourned Sarah and explained the horror of what she'd suffered through as a means of aiding local police forces prepare for more dangerous encounters in this dark realm now on everyone's radar. The mountain men were eventually captured and put behind bars. Collectively, Hank and I couldn't shake a newfound vigilance against unusual noises at night or similarly disfigured strangers crossing our paths. We knew evil was lurking around every corner, as tangible as the polluted air surrounding us waiting for its next innocent victim. This happened to me six days ago. My name's Huxley Barson and I needed one last adventure before starting my career as a financial analyst. I decided to hike an unfamiliar trail in the Appalachian Mountains with a couple of friends, Omer Elston and Pax Dystilla. We reached the trailhead late in the afternoon and felt eager to explore the untouched beauty around us. The towering trees and boulders welcomed us. We started our hike chatting and laughing along the way. As we trekked deeper into the forest, I revealed bits of personal background to my friends. You know, my grandpa was one of the first forest rangers in this area, I said nonchalantly. Really? Ulmer asked, intrigued by my family history. Yet, yeah, he was always telling stories about life out here, I replied, sharing his enthusiasm. Following our paper map and a rusty metal sign deeper into the woods, we continued with high spirits until realizing that we were undoubtedly lost. No trails matched our reliable map, and panic set in among all of us. A soft breeze seemed to hint that ominous clouds loomed above us. Completely out of cellular range, we couldn't call for help or check GPS for guidance. At this point... Things changed in an instant when we stumbled upon evidence of a violent scene, an abandoned campsite filled with ripped tents, scattered supplies, and blood stains. Ulmer noticed a few bullet casings on the edge of a fire pit that looked like it had gone cold weeks ago. The shocking sight made us nervous but determined to return to safety without hesitation. Suddenly, Ulmer spotted something resembling a shortcut back through the thick woods. We wasted no time following this path when shrill screams echoed nearby. We didn't know if it was human or animal but felt compelled to investigate further despite our terror. As we stealthily approached what we thought was the source of the cries, Paxty's foot got caught in a snare. We tried desperately to free her from the trap but her leg had swollen, making it impossible to remove the metal teeth digging into her flesh. Before we could think of a solution, a shadowy figure emerged from the trees. This gaunt man with fierce eyes and sharp features stood tall against the dimming sky. 
He wore tattered clothes and held a large hunting knife that glinted in the remaining sunlight. Silently, he approached us with a slight grin while a group of similarly dressed, menacing individuals appeared out of nowhere. They were armed with primitive-looking weapons and showed off their scars as badges of honor, while they drooled hungrily at their new prey. We knew right away that they were cannibalistic mountain men from generations old legends, heartless hunters who feasted on anyone unfortunate enough to stumble into their territory. Knowing that we couldn't call for help due to lack of cellular reception, they surely knew we were trapped. With tremendous effort, Pax Tai managed to break free from her entrapment by sacrificing her leg to these vicious creatures. The ordeal continued as we fought bravely but faced insurmountable odds. The mountain men gained ground on us, determined to add our group to their future meals. Desperate to escape, I quickly assessed our surroundings and spotted a narrow path that seemed to lead away from the cannibalistic mountain men. As our adrenaline kicked in, we sprinted towards the path, hoping for a chance to survive. Over here! I shouted, leading Pax Thai and the others through the rough terrain that was alien to us. As we stumbled along, my heart raced at the sound of our pursuers' footsteps, each one echoing closer and closer. With Pax Thai visibly distraught from her gruesome injury, we knew it was near impossible to outrun them. The constant threat of danger compelled us to make a daring decision, split up. Go on without me urged Pax Thai bravely. I'll only slow you all down. One of our members stayed behind with her in an attempt to buy us time, knowing their own chances of survival would be grim. With tears streaming down our faces, we offered our gratitude as we wished them well in their final stand. As we fled further into an unforgiving wilderness, we attempted various techniques to throw them off our trail. It wasn't long before exhaustion set in and desperation grew, as these monstrous humans continued doggedly in pursuit like bloodthirsty wolves. Eventually crossing paths with a rushing river, we decided that traversing its treacherous waters would be better than facing those monstrous predators back on land. Without hesitating, I plunged into the icy current with my companions close behind me. The cold numbing water surged powerfully around us, making it difficult for us to maintain control of ourselves. My vision blurred as I focused solely on staying above water and pushing through the overpowering flow. Miraculously, after what felt like an eternity warring against the current's relentless force, we reached land again. We could no longer hear or see signs of pursuit which offered us a momentary reprieve we sorely needed. Though physically and emotionally drained, we painstakingly traced our steps back to civilization. Re-entering society did not mark the end of our ordeal. It carried on in the form of haunting memories that relentlessly plagued us. Though our story was met with skepticism by many, there were those who understood the gruesome possibility of what may have been occurring on that forsaken mountain. Still, we felt dismay that our futile cries for help went unheeded as we recalled the time when we desperately sought any semblance of human intervention, only to find ourselves without cellular reception, alone and vulnerable. Our lives would never be free from the scars both visible and invisible. Those mental images of friends forced to make unimaginable sacrifices etched painfully in our minds. We turned to counseling and comforted each other for solace but knew that nothing could ever eradicate those harrowing experiences. While it's difficult to fully suppress a deep-seated desire for revenge after seeing their horrifying ritual unfold before us, I could never go back. It was a brutally unjust conclusion for Pax Thai who suffered so much. Facing such a gruesome reality made us cherish our remaining loved ones even more fervently. We came together as a community to support each other through nightmares, tears, and endless questions that remained unanswered. In the aftermath of those experiences, 
we vowed to dedicate ourselves to warning others about wandering too far off from safety, ensuring future adventurers would be mindful of their surroundings during treks into nature's wild expanse. This happened to me only a few weeks ago. My name is Theodore Benson, and I've always been fond of hiking and exploring the wilderness. It all began when I decided to take a hike on one particular trail in the vast, astonishing Appalachian Mountains. As I ascended, each step seemed more enthusiastic than the last. The vivid colors of the leaves painted an exquisite canvas over my head. Conversations with locals rang in my ears, recounting tales of uncharted territories and bewitching mysteries. Of course, I never believed them, merely considering them entertaining folklore. Not far into the trail, a marvelous scent wafted through the air. It was freshly baked bread from Elsa's bakery down in town. The memories of their scrumptious treats made me chuckle as I remembered Elsa scolding her clumsy husband, Franklin. Strolling further, I came across some peculiar markings on trees that looked suspiciously like bullet holes. Shaking off any concerns, I carried on until I stumbled upon a torn piece of fabric snagged on a branch nearby. As sweat dampened my forehead and matted my hair to my skin, I felt an eerie stillness around me. Gazing at the fabric closer, I discovered dried blood on it an unnerving discovery. My skeptical nature led me to believe that someone had merely wandered off course and perhaps injured themselves accidentally. Suddenly, there was a scream echoing through the woods. Blood ran cold in my veins, but curiosity overpowered fear. Gradually progressing towards the unnerving sound source, a mixture of curiosity and concern overwhelmed me. Heart pounding in my chest like never before, long-lost paternal instincts started to kick in. Every rustle and snap fueled an even stronger urge for protection as I mumbled to myself. What if someone needs help? What if they're dying? Cautiously proceeding further into the depths of the forest, I realized there was no self-service and unfortunate, isolating reality of nature. As dusk set in, the light dimmed and chilling darkness crept over the landscape. A slight glint of metal hidden deep within the shadow caught my eye, and my breath hitched as I discovered a bloodied pocket knife beneath some dried leaves. Alarmed, I began to question my sanity for putting myself in a potentially dangerous situation. All of a sudden, there stood a man before me with sinister eyes and stained clothing. The grotesque image unveiled by the weak glow of my flashlight. He was gnawing on what appeared to be human flesh. A freezing wave of dread washed over me as I realized just how dire this predicament truly was. Suspecting that these horrifying rumors might hold some truth in them after all. Who? WHWH, who are you? I stuttered, breathless with terror. The cannibalistic man stared silently but menacingly at me, refusing to respond. Fear coursed through every inch of my being as my intuition screamed at me to run, but my legs refused, cemented in place by primal horror. My heart raced as I continued observing this unnaturally tall figure bathed in darkness. His hair matted with blood and grime and his teeth bared menacingly like a wild beast preparing to pounce. I made an effort to discreetly step back when I noticed the mountain man's group emerging from the shadows. Their haunting gazes bore into my soul as they slowly approached me with malicious intent. Each second felt like an eternity as they drew closer, their horrifying true nature revealed through each gruesome detail that emerged under the dim glow of moonlight from above. One smaller mountain man toting a large shotgun and his comrade carrying human limbs wrapped in cloth like twisted trophies. In a panicked attempt to escape this horrific sight, I reached for my phone to call for help. 
My hands trembled violently as I managed to dial 911. The sound of the phone ringing echoed in my ears while I tried to speak as quietly as possible. 911, what's your emergency? said the operator. There's a group of people here. They're cannibals, and they're dangerous. Please send help immediately, I whispered desperately. Can you give your location? the operator asked calmly. I don't know. I took a wrong turn and ended up here. I replied, forcing back tears. Somewhere in the mountains. Stay on the line. We'll try to track your location, assured the operator. Just as hope began to fill me, one of the mountain men detected my presence and lunged toward me with a ferocious snarl. Instinctively, I threw my phone at him, only to watch it shatter against his skull. It was futile. They continued their relentless pursuit. I sprinted through the dark forest, branches slashing at my clothes and face. Adrenaline pumping through my veins, fear drove me to keep moving despite them hot on my heels. Alongside terrifying growls and their howls in the moonlight, another sound sliced through the air. Gunshots. A bullet was past me, making me zigzag desperately among the trees. The man with the shotgun was relentless, but so was I, determined to survive this living nightmare. As another gunshot rang out and a bullet struck a tree just inches from me, I realized that calling for help had been futile. No one would reach me before these mountain men did. Sudden movement caught my eye, another unfortunate soul trapped in their web of terror. She was cornered by the largest mountain man near a rocky cliff face. Her valiant struggle against him ignited a spark within me, and against my instincts, I took a risk. I charged at the gun-wielding mountain man and tackled him. The shotgun flew from his grasp, landing just beyond the cliff's edge. The girl seized her opportunity, slipping past her captor while he was distracted by the commotion. I tried to scramble back to my feet, but the mountain man's powerful grip clenched around my ankle, dragging me towards him. Desperation fueled my frantic kicks, but each attempt only seemed to make him stronger. Then a sudden deafening roar filled the air, a helicopter. Its searchlight illuminated the night sky and revealed our horrifying pursuit. The mountain men halted in their tracks temporarily blinded by the light. Seizing this chance, I wrenched my leg free from his grasp and joined the girl in our desperate flight. The helicopter whirred overhead while we ran for our lives. Gunshots rang out once more but were soon drowned out by the furious rotors above. With each step we took, I prayed for our rope of hope, the first responders who would finally bring us to safety. Finally, after what felt like an eternity of running, we stumbled into a clearing where police officers waited with guns drawn. The sight of their badges filled our hearts with an indescribable sense of relief. Their swift actions ensured that not only our safety was secured but also that of future travelers who might have crossed paths with these monsters lying in wait. The mountain men were captured after a grueling standoff, they'd have no chance to haunt us or anyone anymore. In the aftermath of this harrowing ordeal, I struggled to wrap my head around what transpired that fateful night. I learned that the stranded girl had narrowly escaped death. Her family hadn't been so fortunate, torn apart by those savages to satiate their sickening desires. Every day forward, a solemn vow bound me to her, as we each carried the scars of our ordeal. We dedicated ourselves to honoring the innocent lives lost in this twisted tale, ensuring their memories lived on with dignity and grace. And though life had forced us both into the darkest corners of humanity, we found solace in the light of our shared experience, understanding that even in the midst of nightmares, hope could still persevere.
This happened to me a few summers ago. I'm Dave Briggs, a pretty average software engineer who loves hiking in my free time. Never had any unusual or frightening encounters until that fateful day. My journey began at Spruce Knob, West Virginia, the highest peak in the Allegheny Mountains. The air was crisp and the trails winding through tall pines provided great sightseeing. I planned for a two-day hike through the lush evergreen forests and dense fern-filled valleys. On my first day, after a few hours on the trail, I stumbled upon an unsettling scene, a bloodied backpack discarded among rocks and what looked like torn clothing scraps. My curiosity turned to apprehension as thoughts of injured hikers rushed into my head. I decided to seek help immediately. I reached for my phone but realized there was no signal. With urgency mounting, I hastened my steps and picked up the pace towards the nearest ranger station. As darkness fell, I entered a dense forest where the pines blocked out most of the light. A chilling wind rustled the needles above while distant animal calls echoed through the trees. Tension filled me with each sound in the eerie silence. It wasn't long before I heard something that made me stop dead in my tracks, unmistakable human screams echoing from deep within the woods. Despite feeling paralyzed with fear, I knew I had to investigate. The source of the cries led me off trail and deeper into blackness of nightfall, until finally discovering their source. A horrifying scene unfolded before my eyes three monstrous figures hunched over the torn body of a man whose terrified face was contorted in agony. Frozen with terror as I observed their grotesque feast from behind a tree trunk, I saw them clearly for the first time. These were not ordinary men but some sort of twisted mutant cannibals all were muscular giants with matted hair and overgrown facial features, their teeth sharpened to points, and their fingers elongated, tipped with claws. As the chilling reality of my situation sunk in, urgency replaced fear. I decided it was time to summon the courage to escape before they noticed my presence. I slowly retreated careful not to make a sound, adrenaline coursing through me like a torrent. This was no longer a simple hike but a desperate race for survival. If only I had someone to help me I wished desperately for the comforting presence of my best friend Kelly, who regrettably had declined my invitation due to an important work deadline. I knew reaching the nearest ranger station was crucial. The forest around me felt alive every rustle and distant animal call set my heart racing. Despite seemingly endless hours evading these bizarre murderous beings, though still under the cloak of darkness, I finally glimpsed light a dull ember glow carrying faint hope among the shadows. As I drew closer to what appeared to be a flickering campfire, feelings of relief mingled cautiously with dread. Fires usually meant people, but could they be trusted? Only one way to find out. I approached cautiously from downwind, attempting to gather intelligence on the inhabitants before revealing myself. Soft voices murmured just beyond the circle of light cast from glowing coals within a small fire pit. Peering through gaps in foliage, I discerned four figures huddled around the dying embers all seemingly ordinary humans dressed in rugged outdoor attire, completely unaware of both my presence and lurking danger nearby. My initial instinct was to announce myself boldly and beg assistance. Nevertheless, caution prevailed for all I knew these newcomers could have sinister connections to my monstrous pursuers. Their conversation turned light-hearted as someone shared what sounded like an absurd joke. Why was six afraid of seven? Because seven, eight, nine. Despite overwhelming terror gripping me moments earlier, a brief chuckle bubbled up through my inner panic. I decided that these hikers must be friendly, and I stepped out of my hiding place to approach them with a mix of desperation and hope. As I did... A sudden rush of movement caught my eye, sending a fresh surge of terror through my veins. 
The monstrous giants were upon us, stalking ominously from the shadows. Panicked, I opened my mouth to shout an urgent warning, but just as quickly froze for one among the cannibals raised what appeared to be a hunting rifle slowly to its shoulder, gleaming muzzle now pointing directly at me. My body stiffened, paralyzed with fear, as the cannibal aimed the rifle at me. The peaceful atmosphere around the campfire evaporated within seconds. The hikers turned their heads in my direction, and two of them gasped at the sight of my pursuers emerging from the darkness. Run! I screamed at them, keeping my eyes locked on the rifle-wielding giant. The hikers reacted quickly, scrambling to their feet and fleeing in all directions. The monstrous beings followed them, those who were unarmed giving chase while the one with the rifle kept its weapon aimed at me. As it neared I saw that this brute was covered in filth and tattered clothing, an unkempt beard covering much of its face. In that split second when I knew that both I and the hikers were in mortal danger, something boiled up from within me a primal desire to survive at all costs. As fearful as I was of the monstrosities before me, I resolved not to die without a fight. I picked up a hefty branch from the ground and lunged at the giant with the rifle. The ensuing chaos was a blur. My memory is fragmented by adrenaline and terror, vague recollections of shrill screams and desperate shouts, of limbs flailing and branches cracking. But one image remains seared into my mind— the horrors etched upon the faces of these monstrous men as they descended upon us like wolves upon sheep. The confrontation concluded as suddenly as it had begun. I found myself sprawled on muddy ground, every muscle in my body throbbing with pain. Crawling towards a nearby tree, I tried catching my breath. Amidst my confusion and exhaustion, one thing was clear had to find help. Muddy and wounded but alive, I ran through tangled woods without pause or thought for exhaustion or danger. Soon enough, though it felt like an eternity, I stumbled upon a dirt road, with tire tracks imprinted in the wet mud. I cried out in desperate relief. As luck would have it, just around the bend came a ranger's vehicle. Halting near me, the ranger helpfully exited his truck and supported my efforts to stumble toward him. "'What happened to you?' he asked, as I collapsed into the passenger seat. "'The others,' I gasped, before explaining as much of my ordeal as I could. The ranger, who introduced himself as Officer Simmons, listened grimly to my account before advising me to rest while he contacted his colleagues for assistance." By the time we returned to the campsite with reinforcements, dusk had fallen and an eerie silence hung over the area. Shivering with cold and terror despite a warm thermal blanket wrapped around my shoulders, I watched as officers scoured the scene for any signs of life or evidence of our attackers. They found nothing. As they loaded me into an ambulance— I glanced back at the desolation and knew no trace of the terrible events that had transpired remained. No cries for help or screams of agony could penetrate that stillness. My heart mourned for those hikers who had tried to save themselves but met a gruesome end instead. Days passed and police questioned me about every detail of what had happened that awful night. They came no closer to finding those responsible nor did they uncover any further clue as to their motivation or origin. Despite this seeming lack of progress, authorities assured me they would continue to investigate and do their utmost to bring these inhuman beings to justice. If there was one small piece of comfort in this entire nightmare, it was knowing those brave officers were unwavering in their dedication to hunting down these sinister beings before they could threaten any more innocent lives. My thoughts often drifted back to that ill-fated night and the strange group of hikers around the campfire who found themselves caught in the crossfire between bloodthirsty mountain men and terror filled me. Perhaps I will never know the fates that awaited them, 
but I am forever grateful that despite their own fears, they attempted to save a stranger like me. I have to wonder, though, had my attackers been human, would they have shown us any mercy? This happened to me quite some time ago. I was taking a road trip to explore the beautiful wilderness of Idaho. I had heard great things about Silver City from a friend, Gus Murphy, who had recently moved there. He told me his life had changed for the better since relocating. As I drove, I noticed there weren't many cars on this particular road, which I chalked up to its remote location. As the sun started to descend, I decided it was time to find a place to rest for the night. My phone's GPS lost signal, so I guessed the remaining distance. It was a grave mistake. The darkness enveloped the area as my headlights illuminated an old gas station that appeared abandoned. Pulled over, I tried calling for help, but there was no cell reception. I was hopelessly alone. While searching for a map in my car trunk, the sound of laughter caught my attention. In the distance, I saw shadows moving frantically in the woods just beyond the gas station. That's when I noticed blood splatters on a nearby tree trunk. The chilling realization crept up my spine that it wasn't animal blood. Tense and alert, I recalled Gus's remark about Idaho changing his life and wondered if these people were somehow connected. Without warning, a weather-beaten figure emerged from behind an oak tree covered in tendrils of fog. His rugged face betraying no emotion but tense concentration as he stalked toward me with purposeful strides. Suddenly another shape joined him a lanky woman whose wild eyes scanned their surroundings anxiously as she clutched something obscured by her coat. Instinctively, I hid behind my car with fear coursing through me. Then they stopped, frosty vapor rising from their mouths as they whispered unintelligibly to each other. Their nonverbal communication suggested they were coordinating an attack strategy. Clutching my keys like a makeshift weapon, I attempted to eavesdrop on their conversation. The man said, Lester, you think we can get him? Followed by a response from the woman. Not sure, Clyde, but we gotta try. They didn't seem to consider the possibility of me hearing their plans or, more likely, didn't care. As they approached me, I donned my most convincing smile and greeted them warmly. The ruse seemed to work as they appeared briefly disarmed. Hey there! My name's Hank Thompson. Just got a bit lost on my way to Silver City, I said in an overly friendly tone. They looked confused but motioned for me to follow them. As we ventured deeper into the woods, I tried to keep the conversation light. I shared stories of road trips I'd taken and asked about their own experiences in Idaho. They replied with grunts or mumbled my answers, clearly uninterested in my attempts at bonding. I considered making a run for it when we stumbled upon a macabre scene, a skeletal hand protruding from beneath a mound of leaves. My heart pounded with dread as I recognized what had once been human flesh, now nothing more than bone and decay. I knew I had to act quickly. Spotting a large rock near the skeletal hand, I gripped it with all my strength and swung wildly at Lester's head as he stepped closer. The rock connected with a sickening crunch, and he crumpled to the ground. Clyde roared in rage, lunging towards me. I managed to sidestep at just the right moment, causing him to stumble over Lester's fallen body. Using this window of opportunity— I sprinted back the way we came through the dense forest. Branches clawed at my face and arms as I desperately tried to put as much distance between me and my pursuers as possible. I knew the general direction of Silver City but couldn't be sure of my exact location. As I continued to run, I stumbled upon a small clearing with a rickety old cabin in its center. Without much other choice— 
I decided to seek refuge inside, praying its occupants weren't as unsavory as Clyde and Lester seemed. The cabin door creaked open with a groan, revealing a dark interior littered with debris and filled with dust. A quick search revealed what looked like an old hunting rifle stashed under a pile of newspapers in a corner. Grabbing it, I checked if it was loaded and sighed in relief when I found several bullets still inside. I then moved to one of the windows and scanned the surrounding woods for any sign of Clyde or Lester. The sound of footsteps crunching on dead leaves snapped me out of my concentration. Clyde was searching for me. Not wanting to go down without giving them a fight, I steadied my breathing, aimed the rifle at the doorway, and waited for them to enter. The door creaked open once more, Clyde stepping into the dim light. Before he could react, I squeezed the trigger. The bullet pierced his chest, knocking him off balance. He slumped to the ground, his face frozen in a mix of surprise and pain. A moment later, I heard a gurgling sound coming from outside the cabin. Peering through the window, I saw Lester stumbling away, clearly injured but still alive. I knew I had to stop him. He could still bring more cannibals to hunt me down. I gripped the rifle firmly and stepped out of the cabin. He was slow and weak from his injuries, and it wasn't hard to catch up with him. With a hesitant hand, I aimed the rifle at his head and pulled the trigger one last time. As gunfire echoed through the woods, their gruesome attack now thwarted. I dropped to my knees. My breath was ragged, my hands shaking from adrenaline as I came to terms with what just occurred. With no chance of getting any rest here, nor anywhere else in these cursed woods, exhaustion settled heavily on my shoulders as I forced myself up. In this isolated pocket of wilderness, there was no one coming to help, no one left to call for rescue. Finding my way out of this macabre forest would come entirely down to me. Using my minimal knowledge of survival skills combined with sheer luck, I started walking in the direction that seemed most familiar. For days, I walked through the forest towards Silver City, with each step further from Clyde's and Lester's domain, relief washed over me. When rescue finally arrived, accompanied by a crushing sense of guilt for those who had fallen prey to these deranged mountain men, and perhaps even worse terrors, I swore never again would I venture off the beaten path. The skeletal hand remained etched into my memory, as a chilling reminder of a morbid world hidden right beneath our noses. The search party found nothing but bullet-ridden corpses left behind in that forsaken woodland. Their grim fate condemned them to rest among blood and decay. All that remained of my harrowing ordeal was a chilling lesson in survival and the boundless darkness lurking in the hearts of men. This happened to me about six years ago, when I was traveling alone through the United States. I found myself in a small town named Clearwood, nestled in the Appalachian Mountains. The town, surrounded by thick forests and rugged terrain, had an eerie charm that drew me in. My name is Ezekiel Spencer, and at the time, I was gathering material for a series of short stories focused on life in rural America. Like many traveling writers, my journey led me through isolated and remote locations, which at times could be unnerving but also authentic. I stayed at a bed and breakfast run by Ursula Thwaites, a friendly older woman who welcomed me with open arms. She filled me in on some local history and mentioned that there had been an inexplicable uptick in missing persons cases recently. The townsfolk had become increasingly nervous, as they couldn't figure out the cause behind these disappearances. One evening, after exploring the surrounding mountains and taking countless photographs of the stunning vistas, I returned to my rented cabin. As I reviewed the day's notes and images on my laptop, 
I heard a faint sound outside. Upon opening my door to investigate, I discovered a man with long, dirty hair and tattered clothes limping towards me across the yard. He frantically called my name, Ezekiel, which surprised me since we had never met before. He introduced himself as Eldon Hoberman, a hiker who had been attacked by some strange men deep within the forest. His description of these men made them seem like something straight out of a horror movie, pale-skinned mountain dwellers with mangled faces who communicated with grunts and gestures rather than words. We quickly decided to phone for help. However, cell service was non-existent this far up in the mountains. Despite his injuries, Eldon insisted on making his way into town to alert someone about his terrifying experience while I stayed behind to keep an eye on the cabin. As night approached, I sat by the fire, attempting to capture Eldon's desperate pleas and the menace of our situation within my story. I was soon interrupted by a pounding noise on the cabin door. Startled, I glanced through the peephole only to witness several humanoid figures with twisted faces and blood-stained hands bashing their lifeless fists against the door. Realizing that these were probably the cannibalistic mountain men Eldon had described, I knew it was crucial to get out of there and find help. I jumped out of a window at the back of the cabin and sprinted down a path while clutching my camera tightly in my hand. The grotesque creatures followed closely behind their guttural growls echoing in between my own panicked breaths. My hope for survival seemed dim as the trail grew darker and more treacherous with each passing minute. In my mind, I pictured Ursula waiting up for me at the bed and breakfast, a beacon of safety I desperately hoped to reach in time. The inhuman creatures continued their pursuit, gaining ground relentlessly. Suddenly, I found myself cornered with no escape route in sight. As they closed in on me from all sides, an overwhelming feeling of terror washed over me. Gasping for air, I raised my hands defensively, bracing myself for their imminent attack. With my hands raised in defense and the cannibalistic mountain men closing in, I knew I had to do something or face certain death. I remembered that I still had the camera in my hand. In a last-ditch effort, I aimed the camera's flash at their twisted faces and pressed the button, filling the air with a blinding light. I didn't know if it would work, but it was better than nothing. The creatures recoiled as if they had been hit by a bolt of lightning. Taking advantage of this brief moment of disarray, I darted between them and kept running deeper into the woods. My only hope was that they wouldn't recover quickly enough to catch up with me. As I stumbled blindly through underbrush and over fallen trees, adrenaline coursed through my veins, pushing me to run faster than I thought possible. With every passing moment, the guttural growls grew more distant. It seemed like my risky gambit with the camera flash worked after all. Eventually, through sheer luck or providence, I found myself on a well-trodden hiking trail. Desperately hoping that this could be my path to safety, I kept moving forward as quickly as my exhausted body would allow. While making progress on this trail, I suddenly encountered a group of hikers who were returning from their day's trekking adventure. Upon seeing my disheveled appearance and hearing about my harrowing experience with the cannibalistic mountain men, they decided to escort me back to civilization. Together we carefully made our way down the mountainside under the protective cover of our group's size. The hikers lent me their spare phone which allowed me to call Ursula and inform her about what had transpired back at the cabin. She was at once relieved at my survival and horrified by our friend Eldon's fate. Upon reaching safety at the nearby ranger station, we alerted authorities to the dangerous mountain men who lurked in the woods. I provided a detailed account of my experience and handed over the camera with all its brutal visual evidence. 
The authorities quickly organized an extensive search and rescue operation, hoping to capture or eliminate the cannibalistic mountain men, but they remained elusive. It seemed as though these demented predators possessed an uncanny ability to avoid capture. In the days that followed, I was reunited with Ursula at the bed and breakfast where she had been waiting for me. We mourned Eldon together and contacted his family to relay the devastating news of his encounter with cruel fate. As the days stretched into weeks, I tried to put the nightmarish experience behind me. My sleep was haunted by visions of those twisted, blood-stained faces lurking in shadowy woods, their guttural growls a chilling reminder that true evil can exist in our world. We returned home feeling hollow and changed by our experiences. Yet we vowed never to forget those who were lost to these monstrous beings, Eldon and everyone else who took a wrong turn into that horrific territory. Months passed since my encounter with those cannibalistic mountain men. Their grisly stories spread like wildfire through hiker communities and local residents alike. The mountain range took on a sinister reputation in whispers shared around campfires and amongst friends at local bars. Despite numerous search operations undertaken by law enforcement agencies and seasoned trackers, no trace of these tormentors could be found. It seemed as if they had vanished back into the dark corners of the mountains from which they had come, leaving nothing but death, carnage, and their twisted legacy behind. I pray that wilderness will one day devour them or deliver them into hands capable of putting an end to their malevolent existence. Until then, let this story serve as a warning for those who venture into the mountains. Be vigilant against evil that may lurk within and never take for granted the safety of the well-trodden path. This happened to me a couple of summers ago. I'm John Kepler, a high school history teacher who loves hiking. I decided to explore the Appalachian Trail taking a break from the daily grind. My journey led me to Harper's Ferry, a historic town in West Virginia where my adventure was about to take a terrifying turn. Meeting fellow hikers along the way, conversation flowed easily. Sarah Benteen and her friend Mark Bannister joined my hike, sharing similar interests. We laughed at each other's terrible hiking stories and bonded over our clumsiness on the trek. The deeper we ventured into the trail, the denser the vegetation became. Suddenly, a pungent smell hit us like a ton of bricks. A few yards away, we discovered human remains. Call 911! I hollered, but no one had reception. Panic rose in our throats as we decided to head back together and report the gruesome discovery. As night approached, we set up camp keeping a cautious eye on our surroundings. We couldn't shake off an eerie feeling like someone was watching us. We kept conversations light in an attempt to ease our nerves. I think it has been years since that poor soul died, Sarah whispered. Don't you find it creepy how untouched their belongings are? Let's try not to think about it, Mark replied with a nervous chuckle. The next morning felt peculiarly quiet as we resumed our hike back towards civilization. Soon enough, guttural shrieks pierced the silence, animal-like noises that made our hair stand on end. We need to get out of here! I screamed, running through the dense forest, trying to escape this unseen terror. Every rustle seemed to be growing closer until we stumbled upon another hiker pale and panting gasping for breath. My name is Lena Volkov. You need to leave this place immediately, she cried. My friends were slaughtered by these things. They crave human flesh. These words deepened our dread, but we knew we could not leave Lena behind. She joined our desperate retreat, fear propelling us further towards safety. 
Without warning, a monstrous figure lunged from the trees, scratching at Mark's face. He fell, and we had no choice but to flee deeper into the woods, leaving him fight for his life. This was survival. As we ran, we heard George Fitzgerald's voice, another hiker we had met at the trail's start. Crippled with injury, he hoarsely whispered that these mountain men could only be stopped with a lethal shot to the head. Nightfall enveloped us once more as more horrifying noises blended with gut-wrenching screams echoing throughout the forest. All around us, leaves whispered dark secrets, while malevolent eyes stared from a distance. With Lena and Sarah clutching homemade weapons, I brandished my concealed firearm, a last resort against these cannibalistic mountain men who've chosen us as their latest prey. Our hearts raced as sweat dripped down our faces, and with each crunch of leaves beneath our feet, we wondered whether it would be our last escape attempt. We pressed further into the woods, our makeshift weapons and my concealed firearm offering a fleeting comfort. Sarah and Lena led the way, pausing occasionally to listen, their eyes darting around in search of lurking shadows. Why aren't we calling for help? Lena asked, her voice trembling with fear. Because, I replied, catching my breath. Our phones have no signal here. We're on our own. It was eerily quiet, and each footstep felt like crossing a thin ice sheet that could break any moment. As we cautiously proceeded, we heard faint groans in the near distance. The mountain men were close. I see one whispered Sarah gravely. Ahead lay a disheveled man with unkempt hair and a wild look in his eyes. He looked desperate, deranged even. As he stalked towards us, it became apparent that this was one of the cannibalistic mountain men out to torment us. Our hearts pounded rhythmically with each step he took towards us. We hastily fashioned a plan to evade him by circling around through the brush but our efforts proved futile when another figure emerged from between the trees, blocking our path. Their distinguishable features were evident now, long unkempt beards mixed with unbridled ferocity fueled by some perverse hunger for human flesh. Deciding there was no time to be passive, I fired a shot into the air as a warning, better them know we had weapons than catch us by surprise later. The gunshot only seemed to spur them further. Three more appeared behind us, towering men wielding crude clubs fashioned from gnarled branches and rusted nails. Blood stains adorned their filthy faces, an odious reminder of their last meal. We backed away as quickly as we could without running blindly into another group of these horrifying cannibals lurking in the obsidian darkness. The moon offered feeble light to guide our escape, but we knew it was only a matter of time before we encountered more of them. Our best chance is to find a way off the trails and back to our car, I insisted. Sarah and Lena nodded, bracing themselves for the harrowing gauntlet ahead. We moved carefully, keeping a low profile and treading lightly to dampen any noise. As dawn approached, so did the further edges of the woods. At one point, we crossed paths with two more cannibals. But this time, we were stealthier, hiding in the bushes until they passed without sparing us a single glance. By sunrise, hope returned to our world-weary hearts. We soon discovered a dirt road that led downhill, closer to where we started. Our legs burned with all-too-welcome fatigue as we trekked toward safety. Vehicles appeared from behind highway trees. We made it, I whispered, overcome with relief. While waiting for emergency services to arrive, we recounted the horrors of the night in hushed tones. Sarah contacted Mark's family to inform them of his death indirectly, and resolved to provide stronger details once it was safe. As for George Fitzgerald, we would never forget his advice about stopping these sadistic mountain men, a warning that potentially saved our lives. 
traumatized by our ordeal but grateful for having escaped with our lives, Sarah, Lena, and I vowed never to venture onto mountain trails again. Instead, we would work tirelessly within our community to warn others about returning home safely from these ever-hungry predators lurking in the distant woods a nightmare composed entirely from human roots rather than supernatural tales or folklore beliefs. And every year since then, on an evening spent safely within four walls instead of outdoors amidst nature's shadows and perils beyond human comprehension— we pay tribute to those who had fallen victim to the merciless grasp of these cannibalistic mountain men who still roam these lands, a haunting memory of the night that changed our lives forever. This happened to me several years ago when I decided to explore the Appalachian Mountains. I'm Jim, a real estate agent from Springfield, and I've always been an avid hiker. So this one weekend, I convinced my buddies, Phil, an engineer, and Rick, a graphic designer, to join me on what we anticipated to be a fun adventure. We arrived at the entrance of a seldom-traveled hiking trail. I remember laughing at our collective sense of humor as we started walking. The trail was well-marked, and the view was breathtaking. We chatted about our favorite movies and plans for the future while steadily climbing uphill. At one point, we found ourselves amidst thick foliage, and it seemed difficult to proceed. That's when we discovered a narrow passage leading to an off-trail path. Our curiosity got the best of us, and shortly after setting foot on this uncharted course, we stumbled upon an abandoned shack. Its brown wooden walls were covered with ivy, its windows cracked, and there was an unpleasant smell creeping out of it as if someone had recently cooked something foul. We cautiously approached the shack and peered inside through a broken window. To our horror, we saw blood stains splattered on the floor and various bone fragments scattered around. We exchanged nervous glances. None of us knew what to make of this gruesome discovery. Suddenly, Rick noticed movement in the tree line nearby. Before we could respond, an arrow was past our heads, burying itself into the shack's rotting wall. Instinctively, we sprinted back onto the trail even though heavy breathing followed us through the underbrush. In our confusion about where to run next, Rick took off in a different direction from Phil and me. Unable to see him any more and with fear overtaking our senses, Phil and I continued running along the trail until we stumbled upon another small shelter comprised of stacked rocks. We felt exposed and vulnerable, but we also knew that splitting up was not in our best interests. We decided to double back to find Rick after catching our breath for a few moments. As we retraced our steps, we noticed distorted footprints that seemed to suggest more than one pursuer. Just then, a terrifying scream pierced the air. It was unmistakably Rick's voice. We bravely followed the scream but were horrified to find Rick near a cave entrance, his body mutilated and lifeless, with an axe still embedded in his chest. Tears welled up in our eyes as we realized he was a victim of a cruel, vicious attack. Despite our mourning, we knew our priority had to be escape and survival. As Phil and I pressed forward, everything seemed more threatening, each rustle in the bushes transformed into footsteps of upcoming doom. Arrows continued to fly past us, signaling that our unknown hunters were closing in on their prey. By this point, we relied solely on adrenaline to get away from them. The further we traversed the dense forest, the more desperate and aggressive they became. Soon enough, we saw them, an unkempt group of mountain men sporting animal skin clothes and brandishing weapons of various kinds. Their matted beards obscured their faces with their gaunt cheeks clearly showing malnourishment. Ignoring our aching legs and throbbing hearts, 
We sprinted downhill through obstacles including rocks and falling tree limbs while those pursuing maintained their tracking speed with unnatural ease. Everything happened so rapidly that neither Phil nor I could even consider what kind of help might be nearby. Our only hope seemed to be reaching the main road we had diverged from earlier. We knew we were lost, our cell phones having no signal in this remote area. We had no choice but to keep running. Halfway down the hill, my foot caught on a rock, and I stumbled, falling to the ground. Phil stopped and helped me up as we heard the mountain men closing in on us. The smell of them, a mixture of sweat and rotting flesh, invaded my nostrils, making it hard to breathe. They were closer than ever now, with just a few feet separating us. We stumbled upon a small ravine hidden within the foliage and took a leap of faith, hoping that hiding inside would throw off our hunters. Miraculously, they ran past the ravine without noticing us. We lay there, terrified and panting heavily for what felt like hours. Even though they were no longer near us, I knew they wouldn't give up easily. We couldn't stay in the ravine forever. We needed help. Our only chance was to get to higher ground in hopes that our phone signals could reach emergency services. We climbed back out of the ravine and stumbled upon a narrow path that led upward. As we ascended further, I noticed an improvement in my phone's signal strength. Finally, with enough signal bars, we called for help. The operator picked up immediately, and I frantically explained our situation. Rick's brutal murder by cannibalistic mountain men and our desperate escape from them. With our location relayed to them, our rescuers arrived in what felt like forever but was probably just an hour later. A helicopter approached overhead as we hid in dense shrubbery by their guidance until they deemed it safe enough for us to evacuate. Once aboard the helicopter, we were whisked away from that terrifying forest— tears streaming down both Phil's and my face at the unexpected rescue. Rick's mutilated body was eventually found and taken out of the forest by local authorities. The cannibalistic mountain men remain uncaught and still roam that desolate forest. As for Phil and me, our lives have changed forever, as that gruesome event altered our perception of reality. Days turned into weeks turning into months as we mourn Rick's tragic death. It has become difficult for us even to talk about that day. Neither I nor Phil ever felt comfortable venturing into a forest again, fearing the horrors lurking among the trees. We vowed never to forget Rick's brutal end at the hands of those monstrous mountain men, a haunting reminder that danger can hide in any corner, and life can change in an instant. Nobody could have prepared us for such a horrifying experience, to watch a friend's life taken away abruptly in such savagery. The desolation we feel will forever haunt us as we continue on with our lives without Rick, regretful of our decision to venture off course that day, knowing it was a mistake we'd pay for with his life. The thought of those mountain men still out there, hunting down innocent victims just like us, sends chills through my body. And yet, in a small twisted way, perhaps leaving that story untold is what keeps those cannibals at bay, trapped in their haunting forest lair for all eternity. This happened to me about a decade ago. My name is Bevan Rafferty and I still lived in the small town of Middlesbrough, Kentucky. Life was simple, and I worked at the local gas station, spending free time hiking in the woods. That day, I teamed up with my friend Gerhard Swanbeck for a relaxing hike. Walking through the dense foliage, the sunlight struggled to pierce the canopy. We enjoyed the familiar sights and sounds, bantering about life's mundane occurrences. Hey, Bevan, did you hear Savannah got a new job? Gerhard asked. No way. I chuckled. 
Where? Last time I heard, she couldn't even bag groceries without knocking over a shelf. As we made our way deeper into the woods, a chilling scream echoed through the trees. It was gut-wrenching and distant. Eyes glistening with concern, Gerhardt whispered, We should check it out. Following the scream's direction, we stumbled upon an off-track dirt path flanked by tall grass obscuring our view. Unease clawed its way up my spine. This trail was unknown to us. The end of the path revealed dangling red sneakers from a tree, stained crimson with blood as if their previous owner had been snatched away. Unable to shake the sense of dread enveloping us, we retraced our steps when another blood-curdling scream called for our attention. Almost sounds like Christy Rosenberg. Gerhardt muttered under his breath. Unable to turn our backs on those in need or contact authorities with no phone signal available, we ventured further into unfamiliar territory guided only by fading daylight and muted pleas for help. Through thick brush and jagged rocks we pressed on before descending into a mist-covered valley. Evidence of various people became evident. Scattered belongings littered the ground. I observed Gerhardt closely as sweat and grime mixed on his face. He kept his focus ahead, picking up a muddy wallet from the ground. Bevan, this belongs to Nathan Falco. His voice trembled, he continued. What is happening here? A sudden rustling nearby forced me to snap my head towards the origin. A grotesquely disfigured man emerged from the shadows. Shirtless with a mangle of scars marred his body. Muscled arms ended with bloodied hands holding a gun. Gerhardt and I exchanged panicked glances before running deeper into rough terrain, blindly searching for an escape route. Heart pounding, our frantic movements were masked by fleeting glimpses of unnaturally twisted creatures with beady eyes stalking us on all fours they too carried weapons. Cornered in a dead-end ravine and nowhere left to run, we found cover behind a boulder. Exchanging barely audible whispers laden with terror, I shuddered as Gerhardt revealed that others had reported similar creatures living in these mountains, violent and cannibalistic mountain men who preyed upon those who ventured too far into their land. Between ragged breaths, Gerhardt said brokenly about missing them best at their own game but was interrupted by the sound of footsteps approaching, weapons clanking and guttural snarls growing ever closer. Operating on instinct alone, I fumbled for something, anything, to use as a makeshift weapon, deciding on a jagged rock in the absence of better alternatives. Gerhardt's grim determination mirrored my own as we prepared for an encounter we knew could end so horribly wrong. As our attackers drew nearer, I glanced at Gerhardt, signaling that we needed to split up. We couldn't risk being caught together and annihilated in one go. Nodding in agreement, he threw a distracted punch into the air to signal for aid, though we both recognized the slim chance of our calls for help being answered. We burst from our hiding place behind the boulder, crouching low in separate directions. Angered snarls echoed through the ravine indicating my diversion had caught their attention. I used this chance to escape further into the mountains. Navigating the rocky terrain with difficulty, I barely registered my own footfalls as I focused on eluding those pursuing me. More than once, I encountered a mountain man, horribly scarred with cruel glints in their eyes that seemed to pierce through me. Every encounter left me sprinting further away while narrowly dodging gunshots that threatened to end my life. Eventually, breathless and sprinting on pure adrenaline, I stumbled upon a narrow crevice between massive rocks where I could temporarily hide. With hard hammering and hands trembling, I pressed against the cold stone as if it could shield me from my fate. Sounds of struggle echoed from another direction. Gerhardt's battle cries mingled with the brutal roars of our attackers. It didn't take long before the gut-wrenching sound of tearing flesh reached me. 
it probably wasn't much longer before they brought an end to Gerhardt's life. I mentally reminded myself that we were caught in a life-or-death situation. Fighting back wasn't an option if we wanted to survive. Instead, I stayed hidden in my crevice as my eyes darted back and forth in search of any sign of movement or danger. My relentless dread increased when my crevice's shadows couldn't cloak me anymore. Footsteps grew louder and more frantic as they approached my refuge. A single mountain man burst into the clearing, his face a twisted, monstrous mess of healed-over scars and predatory hunger. He was a perfect representation of one of his kind, cruel, inhuman, and fueled by a bloodlust that knew no bounds. Just as I readied my jagged rock, prepared to strike my hideous foe down if he discovered my shelter, gunfire erupted from somewhere beyond the crevice. The roar of bullets acted like a dinner bell, drawing the mountain man away from me like magic. To avoid detection, I remained motionless until his figure disappeared from sight. Emerging after what felt like an eternity of torture-like waiting, I realized how terrifyingly alone I now stood within the mountains. Without evidence, I couldn't prove these cannibalistic mountain men existed. Gerhardt had likely perished, ending our short-lived alliance against these vile creatures. As doubt scratched and clawed at my mind, a sudden stroke of luck, or perhaps fate, came hurtling into my life in the form of search and rescue helicopters hovering overhead. Gerhardt's earlier gesture for help had paid off after all. Our desperate bid for aid hadn't fallen upon deaf ears. Waving frantically to catch their attention, I made sure to keep an eye out for any pursuers as the helicopter neared. I knew better than to breathe a sigh of relief. Those malformed creatures could very well still be lurking nearby. Safely secured within the vehicle's cabin as it soared away from those forsaken mountains, it became clear that there was no sign of Gerhardt ever escaping with his life. His ultimate sacrifice provided me with the opportunity to live and fight against these gruesome beings another day. In the end, our escape had come at great cost not only was Gerhard gone but also countless others who had ventured into these dangerous mountains before us. It was impossible not to feel survivors' guilt threatened to consume me, yet I clung to the knowledge that my story had to be told. Only through exposure could a warning be given, reinforced by the gruesome truth about those horrifying cannibals inhabiting the dark corners of the mountains. I promised myself to be a voice for the countless victims claimed by these monsters on that day. They must not fade into forgotten whispers throughout time, their stories beseeching future generations to exercise caution when those demons lie in wait. This happened to me about three summers ago, back when I was working as a park ranger in the remote hills of the Appalachians. My name's Kendrick Booker, and I never imagined what I'd discover in those woods. After a long day checking the trails, I started on my way back to the ranger station. The sun was beginning to set when I stumbled upon an oddly dismembered deer carcass. Its headless body lay near the trail legs mangled, an unnerving sight that sent shivers down my spine. Working late into the evening, I couldn't take my mind off that gruesome discovery. Roger Kiplinger, another ranger and close friend, stopped by for our weekly poker night. We sat down, shuffled the cards, and began our game in silence. Man, I swear this place gets creepier every day, I said with a chuckle trying to break the tension? Roger rolled his eyes. Oh, come on now! Do you really believe in all those hillbilly tales? Our laughter filled the room as we continued playing poker. Lost in each other's company, we didn't notice darkness enveloping the area outside the ranger station. Suddenly, we heard a rustle near the window. 
Our laughter ceased as our eyes locked onto shadowy movement just beyond our line of sight. Stay here. Roger instructed firmly before cautiously stepping outside. The minutes that followed seemed like hours as I waited for Roger's return. My gut churned with worry. That's when piercing cries echoed from somewhere outside. Panicking and fearing for my friend, I dashed past the door and into the dark night. Looking around desperately, I stumbled upon Roger's mangled body, barely breathing but alive, leaned up against a tree trunk several yards away from me. Fear painted his face as he gasped for breath. Run! Call for help! He wheezed. I hesitated for a moment, filled with the urge to drag my friend to safety. But knowing I stood no chance alone against whoever did this, I sprinted back to the station. My heart raced as I made the call for backup. Suddenly, out of the corner of my eye, I spotted a grotesque figure that seemed barely human. Even from a distance, its malformed features were visible. Like a primal beast, it was on all fours and began dragging away Roger's barely conscious body into the dark woods. Hours later, when reinforcements arrived, we scoured through the dense forest searching for Roger or any signs of our mystery attacker. Upon finding only fragmented traces of their trail, twisted limbs and blood-soaked leaves, it was chillingly clear our chances of locating them alive were only growing slimmer. As we continued further into the labyrinth-like heart of the woods, we discovered scattered remnants of makeshift homes, crudely constructed using rotting wood and tattered scraps of fabric. Strewn across these sad encampments were gnawed bones, abandoned firearms, and skin-crawling decor fashioned from human remains. The gruesome sight told us that we'd somehow stumbled into forbidden territory, home to those cannibalistic mountain men whispered about in local lore, and they didn't take kindly to intruders. Tension grew thicker amongst our group as we pressed on in search of our missing friends. The very air around us felt like it was closing in with every step deeper into this uncharted territory. Vague rustling beyond our peripheral vision kept us constantly on edge as we struggled to decipher whether another attack was imminent, or if dreaded anticipation was playing tricks on our senses. Expletive-laden banter bounced around nervously amongst those brave enough to break silence. Hey Dino, you ever seen anything like this before? Dino responded with a stiff swallow. In all my godforsaken years of service? Humph, not a chance. Proceeding further into the dense and dangerous terrain, we heard a blood-curdling scream that convinced us beyond doubt. The unimaginable horror was far from over. Frantically, we raced toward its source only to receive nightmarish confirmation that our worst fears had begun to unfold. We discovered one of our own, Bennett Collins, had fallen victim to that grotesque figure. Its grotesquely twisted face leered down at us as it tore mercilessly into Bennett's lifeless body, his screams now silenced for eternity. Gripped by panic, we wasted no time in considering our next move. Fueled by adrenaline and the knowledge that we were now being hunted, we turned and fled through the dense foliage. Every shadow held potential danger, and every step was taken with extreme caution. Dino! What do you make of those things? I whispered as quietly as possible while negotiating the most treacherous parts of the forest floor. I don't know, he replied, the strain evident in his voice. But they're relentless and hungry. Unable to suppress our growing unease any longer, we finally accepted that our missing friends were likely lost forever in the grasp of these vile beings. As a group, we picked up the pace to escape this wretched place, all thoughts now focused entirely on survival. Tearing through the undergrowth, we haphazardly navigated what we thought was our path away from danger, 
each of us hearts pounding wildly in our chests and bodies slick with sweat from exertion and fear alike dead leaves crushed underfoot felt like brittle bones breaking every twig twisted beneath our feet threatening to betray us further every noise a potential alarm warning to our enemies of our presence nearby we barely registered several more chilling encounters among us brief glimpses into an unfathomable reality before those unlucky souls vanished from view entirely these terrifying episodes merely served as reminders of our perilous predicament and fueled our desire even more to leave this nightmare behind as darkness began to envelop us in a silent cloak of despair i realized that my phone still clung precariously within my pocket while i knew its technological capabilities wouldn't help me decipher this alien land or identify those horrible monsters roaming around it did hold at least one feature that could potentially save us gps motioning for the others to stop briefly i switched it on with trembling fingers hoping against hope for a few moments of satellite reception enabling us to pinpoint our position and find a way out of this living hell initially our attempts to contact emergency services went unanswered due to the weak signal or complete lack thereof unrelenting we persisted knowing that we desperately needed help if we had any hope left of enduring this ordeal finally after what felt like an eternity the call connected and we heard the voice of the dispatch operator on the other end spurred by renewed hope we quickly gushed through hurried explanations emphasizing our dire situation and how bruised and desperate we all were without ever mentioning our monstrous tormentors in fear of sounding insane as soon as i get your coordinates i will send someone out to help you immediately the dispatch operator assured us through crackling static stay where you are and remain as calm as possible we pressed onward as discreetly as possible determined not to waste another minute standing still there was a palpable sense of urgency among our ranks as we prayed for rescue it took nearly an hour before we felt that we were finally out of immediate danger though even then our nerves refused to settle fully soon enough the rescue team found us ragged survivors clinging to each other in a tight circle among the treacherous woods guided back through that twisted labyrinth by expert hands who knew these lands far better than anyone else we were led away from death's door and sudden extinction lasting well into the night although nothing could erase those terrible memories etched permanently into our minds images of bennett's lifeless body or glimpses of cannibalistic mountain men lurking among shadows each agonizing step was another painful reminder that no matter what sinister horrors await us in the face of adversity it isn't just about surviving but living with those scars upon our consciousness for the rest forevermore months have gone by since we stumbled upon that uncharted horror but i still find it difficult to sleep through the night i often find myself thinking of bennett and others we lost their lives cut short by the mountain men i constantly wonder if there was anything we could have done to save them we managed to escape though the mental scars suffered that day will remain with us forever the lives of those who didn't make it serve as a testament to the darkness that seethes just below civilization's veneer as haunting as they may be their sacrifices will never be forgotten this happened to me several winters ago in a small town called franklin in north carolina my name is otis seabrook and at the time i was visiting my friend cletus morsefield our plan was to go on a hike through the Appalachian Mountains. My wife had just left me, and I thought that spending some time outdoors would take my mind off things. Cletus, another friend named Edwin Blickley, and I arrived at the trailhead early in the morning. 
The weather was chilly but bearable as the sun started to rise on the horizon. To lighten the mood, we exchanged jokes and reminisced about our college days. After some time, we veered off the main trail to explore a place Cletus discovered on one of his previous hikes. As we navigated the dense forest, we stumbled upon an abandoned campsite littered with torn clothing covered in patches of dried blood splatters. Unsettled by our gruesome discovery, we decided to head back to town immediately. On our way back, Edwin took a wrong turn and led us deeper into unfamiliar territory. We realized we were lost when nightfall approached faster than anticipated, yet we hadn't found our original path or any sign of civilization. While searching for a way out of the woods, someone suggested using their cell phone for help only to find that our phones had no reception in this remote location. The realization that we couldn't call for help filled us with unease. The darkness intensified as shadows danced across our faces from the flickering light of our flashlights. We did our best not to panic but knew that something wasn't right when we heard strange noises echoing through the trees in the distance. Moving cautiously forward with increased vigilance and alertness, we scanned our surroundings for potential threats. Just then, we saw a figure lurking between trees several yards away. Tall and emaciated, with unnaturally long limbs dressed in tattered clothes, it was like nothing we had ever seen before. As we crossed paths with this grotesque being, its filthy, matted hair covered much of its face, obscuring most of its features. The only visible part of its face, however, was its mouth, which revealed rows of sharp, jagged teeth stained a deep and morbid red. It stared at us and lunged with an eerie silence before disappearing into the darkness leaving us shaken and terrified. Heart pounding rapidly in my chest, I muttered a hasty prayer hoping that we could evade this monstrous being. We tried picking up our pace but were unable to shake the sinister presence that seemed to haunt our every step. No matter how far or fast we moved, the figure always seemed close at hand. We came across several more deserted campsites with similar signs of a struggle, each one more disturbing than the last. Realizing that we were trapped in a deadly, riveting chase with a group of horrific predators lurking in the shadows sent cold shivers down our spines. Our once bearable hike now transformed into a nightmarish ordeal as every creak and rustle had us all on edge. It could have been another lurking predator or our own panicked breathing playing tricks. Our paranoia grew with each passing moment, consumed by fear, overthinking every leaf-strewn path in our attempts to find safety. Feeling utterly hopeless, Cletus couldn't contain his despair any longer and shouted into the night sky for someone anyone to rescue us from this horrifying predicament but his pleas fell on deaf ears as only silence answered his cry. Wordlessly, Edwin pulls out a pocket knife from his backpack and hands it to me. As I grasped the cold metal handle tightly, I understood that the only chance for survival was to confront these vicious beings head-on. The air around us felt suffocating, heavy with dread as we fought against the sinking feeling that our impending fate would be joining other hikers as lifeless bodies buried deep within the wilderness. Although we tried to remain united and resilient under the weight of our ordeal, exhaustion started seeping in and cracks began to form within our group. We couldn't risk letting our defenses down, so we exchanged small jokes in hushed tones, anything to lift our spirits if even just for a moment. Suddenly, one of our group members, Tina, stopped dead in her tracks. Her eyes widened in terror as she noticed what seemed to be a signal from the lurking predators. Without hesitation, she urged everyone to climb the nearby trees as quickly as possible. As I scrambled up the tree with the knife clutched tightly in my hand, I glanced back and saw them a group of wild-looking men with disheveled hair, ragged clothing, and crazed eyes. 
Their mouths were smeared with what appeared to be blood. Dread pooled within me as I realized these were cannibalistic mountain men we had heard whispers about. From our concealed position within the trees, we could only watch in horror as they swarmed below us like a pack of wolves, salivating at the thought of their next meal. Desperation coiled in my chest, and even though I knew it was useless to yell for help, I couldn't resist trying one last time. Our screams echoed through the forest but were swallowed by its vastness. The mountain men began taunting us with guttural laughs and gruesome displays of violence. They mutilated small animals they found and then devoured them raw. Cletus lost his grip on both his sanity and the branch he was holding onto and tumbled down from his tree. Enraged, I brandished my knife preparing to defend Cletus against these monstrous people. My heart pounded as I leapt down from the tree, ready to confront them or die trying. However, Edwin instinctively pulled me back up before I fully descended. We need a plan, he whispered urgently, quickly realizing that confrontation would only put all our lives at risk. I nodded my agreement. We observed silently from our treetop perches as two of the mountain men circled Cletus's fallen form like predators around prey. They proceeded to restrain him with thick ropes and dragged him away into the depths of the forest. Determined to save Cletus despite our fear, we devised a plan. Edwin would create a distraction by navigating through the treetops and dropping heavy branches on their camp while I would slip in from the opposing direction, aided by my pocket knife. Executing our plan without mistake, we managed to reach Cletus in time. We locked eyes as I cut through his bindings with my pocket knife. The expression on his face reflected his appreciation and sheer relief. As we made our escape, we encountered one of the mountain men. His face was contorted with rage as he saw us trying to flee with our friend. I raised my knife to defend us, but thankfully Edwin came to our rescue dropping a branch on the man's head at the perfect moment, knocking him unconscious. Breathing hard and adrenaline surging, we sprinted blindly through the forest. We frantically ran for hours feeling like no amount of distance could put enough space between our relentless nightmare of an experience and ourselves. Eventually, exhausted beyond belief, we collapsed near a river bank. By some stroke of sheer luck, after recovering from our exhaustion by the river bank, we stumbled across a group of fellow hikers who managed to lead us back to civilization via a route they had been following that bypassed the mountain men's territory. We contacted authorities who later searched for the men in question, though ultimately they were never found. To this day, those chilling nights remain etched into our minds as reminders that there are genuine horrors lurking within nature's deceptive beauty. Years have passed since that harrowing experience in the woods, Cletus's life saved by our group's determination, wits, and friendship. Though forever grateful for our miraculous escape from evil's grasp that night, we couldn't help but shudder when recalling those cannibalistic mountain men whose grisly actions will haunt our darkest thoughts for all time. This happened to me many moons ago, back when I used to be an amateur hiker. My name is Orson Fellows, and I'm no stranger to the woods, having grown up in rural Alabama. That fateful day, I decided to explore the dense forest around Mount Thomas, a lesser-known spot in Northern California. I had been hiking for hours when I came across a disturbing scene, clothes scattered all over the place, blood smeared across leaves and rocks. As every fiber of my being told me to turn back, I felt an inexplicable compulsion to solve this gruesome mystery that lay before me. Along the way, I met Karen McFarley, a distressed woman who had been searching for her missing brother. 
We teamed up and decided to explore the deeper parts of the forest together. Our only way of calling for help was Karen's satellite phone, but she hesitated due to the unspoken worry that it would lead predators straight to us. We stumbled upon a moss-covered cabin hidden among the trees. The worn wooden door creaked open on its rusty hinges as we hesitantly stepped into the unkempt dwelling. As we surveyed our surroundings in silence, we found old newspaper articles recounting tales of cannibalistic mountain men preying on unwary travelers. Before long, we heard footsteps outside, along with an unearthly growl that made my skin crawl. We hid behind a dusty old cabinet and watched through a peephole as a hulking figure approached with heavy steps. He was massive arms the size of tree trunks and gnarled hands that looked like they could snap bones without breaking a sweat. He entered the cabin, his filthy beard barely concealing an equally grimy face littered with scars. His dirty clothes were smeared with dried blood, suggesting his sinister deeds extended beyond my worst nightmares. He said nothing, but his cold eyes scanned the cabin intensely. Karen and I held our breaths, our hearts pounding in our chests. We waited for what felt like an eternity, but somehow we remained undetected. The mountain man left the cabin with a guttural grunt, signaling his apparent frustration of not finding fresh meat. As we cautiously exited our hiding spot, Karen and I realized that he had left a map on the table. The blood-stained map showed trail markings that led to another secluded area of the forest. We decided to follow the trail. Perhaps we'd find Karen's brother. As the sun dipped below the horizon, darkness enveloped the forest. We forged ahead using only the light of our flashlights. The gnarled trees loomed above us, casting eerie shadows. Our tension was thick enough to cut with a knife as every sound, falling leaves and snapping twigs, kept us on edge. Our journey led us to a clearing filled with freshly dug graves topped with makeshift wood crosses. Horror gripped us as we knew these were not merely random forest killings. These mountain men had made murder their sacred tradition. Suddenly, a chilling scream echoed through the quiet night, and we saw him in all his monstrous glory. He charged at Karen swift as a gust of wind, sinking his teeth deep into her throat. As she gasped for her last breath, her eyes softened, realizing I would be left alone and facing uncertain death. The howling laughter of his fellow cannibalistic mountain men filled my ears. They had been watching us this whole time. Panic set in as they appeared from behind the tree's grotesque faces that looked like they had come straight out of hell each wielding knives and firearms ready to use on me. In what seemed like my final moments, my instincts took over as I dashed back towards the cabin. As I ran like never before, bullets flew past me while demonic howls filled the darkness. My breath was ragged, legs burning in pain as I neared the cabin. The horrific scenario unfolded behind me. Karen's screams echoed in my ears and the guttural laughter of our pursuers serving as the soundtrack to my impending doom. I knew it was only a matter of time before they caught me and tore me apart just like they had done to those resting in those sinister graves. My heart raced faster than my feet, perhaps already sensing its inevitable fate. And yet... I was determined to push forward and elude death. I burst through the cabin door, locking it behind me as fast as I could. This was my last line of defense against those twisted fiends. I scanned the room desperately for something to use as a weapon or in my defense. Our cell phones had no coverage in this remote area, and calling the police was out of the question. With no time to waste, I dragged a nearby dresser, heaving it in front of the door to barricade myself in. The windows were secured with wooden boards nailed to them earlier. The makeshift fortress would provide protection for now, but I knew it wouldn't be enough if they decided to overpower me. 
I stumbled upon a hunting rifle and some boxes of ammunition stashed at a corner, possibly left behind by previous tenants or hunters in the area. Though I lacked expertise in firearms, I loaded the rifle as quickly as I could manage while silently praying never to use it. The heavy footsteps outside grew closer, pounding against the soft soil like hammers of death. They were here. My pursuers circled the cabin, their monstrous appearances now framed by moonlit outlines. Their mangled teeth glistened with bloodlust while their sinister eyes searched for any sign of vulnerability. The leader, a towering figure with broad shoulders and a scar across his face, signaled for his men to position themselves at every entry point of the cabin. Methodically checking each weak spot, they ensured no escape routes were present before converging at the barricaded door. Suddenly, an ungodly sound erupted from the forest beyond as another victim met their cruel fate. The blood-curdling scream provided a brief distraction that shifted their focus away from me. With no time to spare, I took my chance and squeezed through a hidden door behind the fireplace that led into an underground tunnel. The secret passage could have been built by past victims or perhaps even built by local authorities aware of these cannibalistic maniacs' existence. My only hope was to navigate this dark and narrow tunnel, hoping to emerge in a safe location far away from the nightmare. My heart pounding in my chest, I pushed forward through the darkness, feeling the damp coldness wrapping around me like a shroud. Debris crumbled beneath my feet as I focused on putting as much distance between myself and those monstrous predators as possible. Eventually, the tunnel ended, revealing a small opening to the surface concealed by thick underbrush. I cautiously peered out, scanning the area for any signs of danger. In the distance, I could see a dirt road cutting through the woods with a solitary vehicle parked at its side. The sight provided me with a glimmer of hope that I could escape this horrific ordeal alive. Tightening my grip on the rifle across my chest, I decided to remain concealed and make my way towards the vehicle once daylight broke. For now, safety meant keeping my distance from those mountain men and their gruesome rituals. As night gave way to dawn, I remained hidden among the bushes and undergrowth. The faint murmur of voices grew distant, as though they had abandoned their search for me in favor of seeking out fresh victims elsewhere. The first rays of sunlight illuminated the surrounding landscape with hazy morning colors. In that brief moment of calm, I mourned Karen's loss and everyone else who had succumbed to these vile creatures' brutality. Stealing myself for what lay ahead, I emerged from hiding, holding on to my rifle. Taking one careful step at a time, I approached the car still parked by the side of the road, praying that its occupants would be willing to offer assistance or even provide valuable information to local authorities. As I neared closer to the car, it became evident that it belonged to a passing photographer who had wandered too far into these woods. His lifeless body lay slumped over his camera equipment, yet another victim of these sadistic killers. In that car, I found a lifeline, the keys were still in the ignition, and the engine roared to life as I turned them. With tears of relief streaming down my face, I sped away from the nightmares that had forever changed my life. I left behind an eerie world engulfed by shadows, encapsulating a horror story that would haunt me for the rest of my days. This happened to me several weeks ago while I was hiking in the Appalachian Mountains. My name is Roger Finley, and I decided to take a break from my routine life and explore nature. The Appalachian Trail is breathtaking, filled with lush forests and scenic vistas. Exploring the less traveled paths, away from the main trail, provided me with peace from my crazy office job. 
As I moved deeper into the wilderness, I started noticing strange objects left behind by previous hikers. Broken camping gear, discarded clothes, and ruined shoes. Their presence was odd, but I dismissed them as remnants of careless hikers. It was in a secluded valley where I met Malcolm Rivers. He told me he'd been hiking for years to escape his monotonous life as an insurance agent. We decided to hike together for a while since we were both seeking solitude. In this particular area of the mountains, the forests were more dense and ominous. One day we stumbled upon an abandoned campsite with signs of struggle, torn tents and food supplies scattered around. A chill ran down our spines. Who would leave this place like that? Malcolm whispered nervously. I'm not sure, I replied, but maybe someone got lost or needed help. Though we were disturbed by what we found, we pressed on as daylight began to wane. Later that evening, we set up camp near a small stream. Sitting beside the fire, Malcolm broke the silence with one of his dry jokes. What's a ghost's favorite dessert? I scream, laughing at his humor. Unable to shake the fear spawned earlier that day, it took me longer than usual to fall asleep. Malcolm assured me that it was probably just another group of forgetful hikers who left their belongings behind them trying to eliminate extra weight. At night, rustling leaves nearby jerked me awake. As the noises grew louder and footsteps approached our camp, I clutched a hunting knife for protection. Suddenly, a hulking figure loomed in the shadows. A muscled arm wrapped in old sackcloth, heavily scarred and scratched skin, reflected the flicker of the dying fire. I nudged Malcolm, who jolted awake and gasped at the horrifying figure. We scrambled away and darted into the woods in an attempt to escape our pursuer. The monstrously tall, grotesque man didn't say a word. He simply grunted and chased us. As we fled from the mountain man, we found ourselves between two paths. In the thick darkness, it was hard to tell where they led. Making a split-second decision, we took the path on the right. Breathing heavily and running with all our might, we stumbled upon an old cabin in a deserted village. Believing it was our only chance to hide from our relentless pursuer, we burst in and barricaded the door with a table. Our respite was short-lived when another mountain man crashed through one of the windows, a different beast altogether with a feminine yet mutilated face that seemed to have been applied like makeup over something far worse. She carried a large knife that glimmered in the dim moonlight. In a smoky voice filled with malice yet completely devoid of humanity, she said, Give up now. Stricken with fear, we plowed straight into her, forcing ourselves past this seemingly immortal woman who had been best suited for tormenting lost souls. Our collision sent her reeling backward into another room as we bolted through every wooden door until our legs gave out. Just as it seemed there were no more places left to run or hide within this desolate dwelling, another assailant waiting beyond every corner waited impatiently to ensnare us within their grotesque grasp, one brandishing a metal chain stained by blood and gore another wielding a hot branding iron that was terrifyingly close to our exposed flesh. My hands trembled as I tried unbuckling these mountain men's sadistic instruments from their grasps, my fingers slipping and sliding all over their cold surfaces slick with sweat and terror. In the midst of this nightmare, I realized there would be no help. This deserted village likely meant no one would hear our screams or find us in time if we even attempted to call for help. Instead, we focused on survival, determined to escape the clutches of these monstrous mountain men. I continued struggling with their weapons, finally managing to pry the hot branding iron from one's grasp. I swung it with all my might at the mountain man's face searing his flesh and causing him to howl in pain, a sound that still haunts me today. 
My friend managed to grab the large knife from the first attacker, slicing deeply into her arm as she tried to wrestle it away from him. We stumbled back together as chaos erupted around us. The mountain men regrouped and coordinated their attacks, relentlessly chasing us through the cabin. My friend and I escaped through a narrow side door into the frigid night air, our hearts pounding in our chests. As we moved into the dark woods beyond the village, we hoped our flight would go unnoticed. Behind us, we heard screams of primal frustration and anger. We must have gotten far enough ahead because when they chased after us, we had already disappeared into the night. Down a narrow path lined with old gnarled trees, we came across an abandoned logging truck. Its rusted metal frame held just enough fuel to start it up and get us out of there. Without hesitating, we jumped inside, and with trembling hands my friend attempted to hotwire it a lucky skill he had picked up many years ago. We both held our breath as the engine sputtered to life hearing yells from our pursuers drawing near. The truck lurched forward as my friend pressed down on the gas pedal, taking off at breakneck speed through the woods. The mountain men tried their best to keep up with us, inevitably falling behind. Their furious screeches were growing distant. In the dead of night... We navigated through winding dirt roads, avoiding rocks and fallen branches in our path. After what felt like hours, the sun began to rise, and we found ourselves on the edge of civilization. Worn out and covered in cuts from our desperate fight for survival, we stumbled into a small-town gas station. The attendant eyed us warily, asking if we needed assistance. But what could he do? Would he even believe what had taken place? We merely shook our heads, deciding the fewer people involved in this nightmare, the better. A few days later, as my friend and I reunited to process the harrowing events of that cabin in the deserted village, we realized our occupations, a nurse and an engineer, respectively, did nothing to prepare us for such an ordeal. We decided that telling our story would only lead to disbelief or scorn and opted to keep it to ourselves. Our only hope was that those mountain men never found their way down from their lair. As time passed and wounds healed, I could not shake the images of those horrendous faces and twisted bodies out of my mind. Meanwhile, my friend continued having nightmares about that traumatic night but nightmares that couldn't compare to the gruesome reality we faced. We sometimes wonder if anyone ventured back into that village or crossed paths with those monstrous mountain men who lusted after blood with such intensity. And although we chose not to talk about our experience much or seek answers how they became so depraved, knowing full well that some secrets were best left untold, I can't help but feel grateful for the bond forged between us during that harrowing escape. Yet, every night when darkness falls over my peaceful home, I can't help but shudder at the thought of what could have happened had we not been resourceful enough or if fate had been different. The horrifying memories of that cabin in the abandoned village continue to haunt me, serving as a chilling reminder that true monsters exist not only in our nightmares but in the deepest, darkest corners of the world, awaiting their next helpless victim. We now know that these savage predators lurked within the shadows of the mountain range, hiding their grotesque desires beneath a facade of human features. We survived, but many others before us and possibly after us have not been fortunate enough to escape. This happened to me a decade ago, right outside a little town in West Virginia called Dunbar. My name's Amos Ellswick, and at that time, I worked as a traveling salesman. My job took me all across the country, and while I enjoyed visiting new places, the long drives required to get there were often tiresome. In search of shortcuts, 
I relied on my trusty GPS, but this one particular evening, it led me further into a heavily wooded area where the road quality had begun to deteriorate. Initially unconcerned, I figured a few bumps and potholes were normal for old dirt paths. The serenity of the forest was interrupted by the alarming sound of gunshots somewhere in the distance. I quickly rationalized that hunting must be a popular local activity. Besides, it had eventually stopped once night fell. Growing more suspicious by the minute as the path seemed endless and the day progressed into twilight, I resolved to retrace my steps in search of the main road once I found a suitable spot to turn around. To make matters worse, I noticed there was no cell phone signal. If something were to happen to me out here, no one would know. As dusk settled over the forest path and an eerie silence enveloped me, my fear began mounting with each bump in the road completely understandable given the circumstances. But then came an unmistakable sound, footsteps crunching and fallen leaves around me. Window down slightly for fresher air, straining my ears as they drew closer, my maps rendered useless without any signal. Breaking a sweat, concentrating on those sounds, slow at first before picking up speed as something approached ever nearer. A glance into that dying light revealed hulking shapes lurking among trees with bullets strung across their chests like a twisted garland, their expressions hungry as wolves and eyes gleaming with murderous intent. My foot slammed into the throttle as if to outpace the beat of my terrified heart. But those men, they sprinted after my accelerating car like wild animals unshackled from rationality. The reverberation of gunfire crackling in the air accompanied by thumps on the car echoed through a metallic cacophony. In a mix of terror and adrenaline, I gripped the steering wheel tightly as I swerved to avoid obstacles determined to block my escape from those cannibalistic mountain men. The car jolted violently as more gunshots pounded against its chassis. An ominous feeling clung like fog, obscuring clarity and overwhelming my senses. Panic crept over me, but I focused on speed, the only glimmer of hope left for dragging myself from this ordeal. As a cluster of headlights flashed on behind me from the depths of darkness, I didn't know where my salvation would come from or if it even existed. As automatic gunfire and adrenaline coalesced to form a chaotic symphony, it was clear that I had entered some kind of treacherous snare. The sounds of pursuit grew more intense as my car sped through the dark forest. Gunshots pierced the cold night air, narrowly missing my vehicle. My breath came in ragged gasps as I realized I was completely alone in this deadly situation. Why had I chosen to venture into this isolated region? Did curiosity truly kill the cat, or would I somehow find a way to survive this harrowing ordeal? Questions swirled in my mind, but there was no time for reflection as headlights flashed across my rearview mirror. It seemed the mountain men were relentless in their pursuit. As we continued our dangerous game of cat and mouse— I noticed a break in the trees up ahead. My eyes locked onto a small cabin tucked away from the main road, hoping that whoever lived there could offer me refuge or assistance. I quickly swerved off my current path and barreled towards the structure. As my tires crunched onto the gravel drive leading up to the cabin, several shapes emerged from behind it, similar but distinctly separate from my pursuers. These people were dressed differently and moved more cautiously. They appeared to be locals who had heard the gunfire and come to investigate. With a new group of witnesses present, I prayed that this standoff would end peacefully. Little did I know about that fate had other plans. A battle ensued between the mountain men and the locals, causing me to take cover behind my car. The gunfire was deafening, punctuated by screams of pain and rage from both sides of the conflict. As bullets ricocheted off nearby trees and pelted into soil with sickening thuds, 
I felt immense remorse for bringing such violence upon these innocent people. My mind raced with thoughts of what I could have done differently. If only I hadn't wandered into this nightmarish territory. As quickly as it began, everything fell silent and still. Cautiously peeking out from behind my car, I saw the bodies of two locals and three mountain men strewn across the blood-soaked grass. It was a horrifying sight that would undoubtedly haunt me for the rest of my days. However, I couldn't dwell on such thoughts for long. More mountain men were undoubtedly on their way, and if we didn't act swiftly, it was unlikely any of us would make it out alive. Along with the remaining locals, we formed a hasty plan. With limited time to prepare, we decided that it was best to flee the area as quickly and as quietly as possible rather than try to stand our ground against an onslaught of murderous assailants. As we embarked on our perilous escape from the clutches of terror, we ran through the night as trees loomed overhead. Shadows moved ominously around us, seemingly always just beyond our reach. We could feel fear threatening to consume us. However, reinforced by our strength in numbers, we fought to maintain hope amidst our desperation. When dawn eventually broke through the darkness— and with it hope that we might finally be free from this carnage. We stumbled through dense underbrush towards civilization, only daring to breathe a sigh of relief when the first sighting of a main road appeared in the distance. Upon reaching relative safety, exhausted but alive, I could finally pause for a moment to recognize the gravity of what had just occurred. The survivors from the cabin and I exchanged knowing looks, we silently acknowledged that our lives were irrevocably changed by these events. Overwhelmed with fatigue and grief for those who had lost their lives during this fateful ordeal, I bid farewell to our ragtag group as we agreed never to speak of these horrors again. We always held a solemn understanding that each of us would mourn those lost not through words but within our own hearts, sanctuaries untouched by these nightmares and so ended this ordeal once thought unimaginable. Through great loss and sacrifice, a small few found the strength to survive cannibalistic hunters in a place where humanity seemed lost. While I may forever be haunted by those dark woods, the mountain men, and their murderous intent, I'll also carry the courage of survival and the hope that somehow, humanity may still one day defeat our darkest fears. This happened to me nearly three summers ago. I was on a hike through the Appalachian Trail near Harper's Ferry, West Virginia. My name's Wilton Sandys, and at the time, I worked as an accountant, desperately needing an escape from the city life. The trail was peaceful, and I struck up conversations with fellow hikers who shared tales of their trails. By the end of the day, we sat around a campfire as twilight set in. The fire crackled. One of the hikers, Letitia Kennerley, who was a local guide, recounted stories about murders and missing people in these woods. Skeptical seems to be your middle name. My fellow hiker Agrippa Mosby joked when he caught me rolling my eyes. Stories are stories. I shot back with a grin. But tomorrow's hike awaits us. The next afternoon found us in unfamiliar territory. We'd taken a wrong turn off the main path and were following what seemed to be an old logging route into dense woods. As we advanced deeper into the woods, we stumbled upon a disturbing sight, a makeshift camp with ragtag tents and what looked like human remains strewn around. They bore teeth marks. Some of my fellow hikers wanted to call for help but realized they couldn't. There was no cell phone signal in this area. Terrified but determined to help those who might still be alive, Letitia took charge and led us carefully through the treacherous terrain. Our footsteps were slow as if weighed down by the horrors that cloaked our surroundings. 
We ventured farther from the campsite when we heard faint screams echoing through the trees. We hurried quietly towards them and found ourselves witnessing unspeakable horrors. A group of mountain men surrounded someone tied to a tree. They had bloodied mouths and knives glinting in their hands. Their intent was clear, cannibalism. It was then that I took a good look at the one in charge. He was a disfigured, massive man with terrible burn marks scorched into his face, wearing what seemed like a patchwork of human flesh stitched together like a gruesome quilt. Agrippa whispered that they looked like the mountain men from local legends, but I still couldn't believe my eyes. Without time for further examination or thought, they saw us and snarled. Instinctively, we sprinted in different directions among the chaos, leaving behind screams and gunshots that horrified and confused those who scattered. My heart pounding in my chest, I ran faster than ever before, barely avoiding obstacles in the dimming light. Suddenly, I heard cries for help and found Elima Stockfish, a member of our group, wounded and lying in a ditch, not far from another mutilated body. As blood trickled down Elima's shirt, and he struggled to speak coherently through the pain, he handed me his gun, a battered revolver with only one bullet left. A shiver ran down my spine as I took it reluctantly. It's all that's left. Ely Moss muttered between ragged breaths. Give them hell for Lavina. We'll find help. I reassured him before leaving him in search of safety. Minutes stretched to hours as I continued on my journey upwards. It felt as if there were eyes on me everywhere, the mountain men lurking just out of sight, their presence building dread within me at every turn. At last, I reached an old fire tower in an open area high above tree line, my best hope for signaling help. With trembling hands, I managed to light a signal fire using some wood and gasoline found amidst the storage inside the tower. The wind carried smoke high above the trees. This had to be enough to signal for help. Adrenaline and dread churned within me, as did the knowledge that the mountain men could be here any minute. As I stood watched near my signal fire, my ears picked up distant footsteps, many of them. I knew I had to do something. I could not stay at the fire tower and wait for the mountain men to find me. If help did not come, I needed a plan. Clutching the revolver with its single bullet, I gritted my teeth and focused on coming up with a strategy to survive. While exploring the fire tower, I stumbled across a map that detailed the area. The high elevation granted me an advantage of seeing a wide expanse of the terrain. From my vantage point, I spotted what appeared to be an abandoned logging road on the opposite side of the mountain, an escape route. Desperation and fear pushed me to make my decision. Abandoning my signal fire, I armed myself with some leftover wood as a makeshift weapon alongside the revolver Eli Moss gave me. Leaving only a note with my plan carved into it, I set off for the logging road. The journey was fraught with danger. Branches snatched at my clothes and skin while jagged rocks threatened to catch my footing. The distant sounds of footsteps never ceased, constant reminders that the mountain men were close behind. Yet, without much choice, I trudged onward. Time seemed to slow as exhaustion racked my body. But finally, after hours of trekking, I made it to the abandoned logging road. The path twisted into the mountainside as it wound its way downhill, a lifeline away from certain death. However, fate was far from merciful to me. While cautiously making my way down the narrow path, glimpses of movement ahead alerted me that something dangerous approached. One of these cannibalistic hunters had found me first. Seeing that I had nowhere left to run or hide, I readied myself for confrontation. Sweat dripped down my forehead as blood pounded in my ears, heavy breaths filled with dread echoed in tandem with each heart-pounding moment. The mountain man broke through the cover of trees, 
giving me a good glimpse of him. Standing taller than most men and covered in unkempt hair, he bore scars that seemed to have a life of their own. Despite his monstrous appearance, something in his eyes revealed his humanity, a deeply rooted, twisted desire to hunt, kill, and consume was what pushed him forward. The look was unmistakably chilling. He charged at me with a sharpened stick, his weapon of choice. Despite my fear, I managed to parry his attack with the wood I gripped defensively. After a few close calls and intense struggle, an opportunity presented itself, while the mountain man reeled from a particularly powerful swing that connected with his arm. I took aim at him with the revolver. The gunshot echoed through the valley as the bullet struck its mark. The mountain man fell to the ground with a guttural exhale. But my victory was short-lived. Without warning, several more mountain men stepped out from cover around me. They examined their fallen comrade but didn't seem to care about his demise. Panicking and desperate for any chance of escape, I took advantage of their momentary distraction. With a combination of adrenaline and instinct guiding me, I sprinted down the logging road knowing full well it might be leading me straight into a trap. As I raced down the path, the sun dipped below the horizon. However, I could not afford to stop even for a moment's rest. Suddenly, I heard helicopters in the distance. Their powerful searchlights scanned the terrain below. In an incredible stroke of luck or divine intervention, my signal fire had worked after all. The glare from one searchlight found its way through the dark trees and swept across me as I stumbled onto an open spot by an abandoned logging camp, all within view of my pursuers who stopped short at the tree line. Help! Over here! I shouted to gain their attention before collapsing to the ground, completely exhausted. The maniacal laughter of the mountain men rang in my ears as they retreated back into the darkness and disappeared from sight. I caught a brief look, and their faces still haunt me, yet through it all, I knew I survived and would help Elimas find justice for Lavina. This happened to me three summers ago, right before I started college. At the time, my family and I lived in a small town near the Appalachian Mountains called Blakesville. Life was slow, and spending weekends hiking was my favorite way to pass the time. I should mention that I'm not your typical hiker no training or special gear, but I knew the basics, how to navigate and avoid certain plants. My name is Seth Adler, just a friendly guy from a small town in the USA. One weekend, I decided to venture further into the mountains on a trail I hadn't explored yet. The trail started easy enough but grew steeper as I continued uphill. Trees here were ancient and thick as if holding secrets from before my time. I noticed remains of what looked like an old campsite next to the clearing of a hunting lodge. Examining closely revealed old rusted cans and torn clothing. As I climbed higher on that treacherous path, I stumbled upon something disturbing, a partially buried boot with human-like bones emerging. The shock was undeniable. My hands shook as sweat dripped down my face. Pausing for a moment, I listened to my surroundings, hearing whispers of people who shouldn't be there. Trying to make sense of it all through tense laughter, feeling terror growing inside of me with each passing moment. Making the choice to push forward instead of turning back, hoping for answers so grimly placed before me. Continuing along that path lined by towering trees like sentinels over forgotten graves. The forest seemed alive with every new crunch underfoot, leaving me fearful and cautious as I continued through it. Darkness surrounded me due to the thick canopy overhead blocking out sunlight and hope alike. Somewhere along that trail in those shadowy woods, eerie glances registered in my mind's eye, 
shapes resembling tall men masked by darkness against tree trunks or walking among them in ghostly gait. As the haunting sensation swirled, I suddenly stumbled into a booby trap of alarming ingenuity. Wires drawn tightly on the ground, causing me to stumble with startled surprise. In a moment, I was surrounded. Men appeared from behind trees and in the shadows like ghosts come to life. Their appearance was frightening, stained and torn clothing hanging off skeletal frames, faces sunken with hunger and malice glinting in beady eyes that devoured me completely. A laugh I had never heard before or since escaped from one of them. It sent shivers down my spine as they closed in. My hands trembled as I fumbled for something, anything, car keys, pocket knife, trusty rock, nothing solid that could grant me even momentary safety in the face of these horrifying men. Anticipating their next move was impossible. Instinct told me flight would likely end badly, but fight seemed equally doomed. Ensnared by their cold grasps and being dragged toward a cave entrance littered with gnawed bones and the smell of death, dread filled every corner of my soul. I'd heard myths about cannibalistic mountain dwellers but dismissed them as wild tales spun to frighten on cool summer nights. It became evident these men had no intention of releasing me. Bound hands and feet were brutal standards for being ritualistically harvested like wild game hunted for sport. The taste of bile rose in my throat as panic surged through every cell. In desperation, I let out a guttural scream against my captors while they responded by biting down on their lips for confirmation or even morbid enjoyment. Help seemed an improbable luxury amidst this living nightmare. I juggled images in my mind, wondering how I had missed any reports of missing hikers or gruesome discoveries that could have warned me against venturing too far into these perilous forests frequented by predators who walked on two legs instead of four. But hope was not entirely lost, as they had begun to drag me away. Feeble cries from another captive caught my attention. I recognized the voice from my town. Could it be a friend? My heart raced in anticipation and desperation. The captors paused to debate something, which allowed me a brief opportunity to devise an escape plan. My eyes darted about, taking in my surroundings and considering options that might provide some chance for survival. I noticed a loose rock near my feet and decided to use it to my advantage. As an experienced climber, I could attempt to dislodge the rock and have it fall towards the cannibalistic mountain men. It might not cause serious harm, but at the very least, it could provide enough of a distraction for me to break free and escape. The captive from my town mustered the strength for one more cry for help. I glanced at them, realizing they needed to use this moment of distraction to our advantage. With all the strength I could muster, I kicked the rock towards my captors. The mountain men turned their attention toward the commotion and shielded themselves from the falling debris. As they stumbled back with surprise, I used their momentary disarray to my advantage and broke free from my restraints. I sprinted towards the other captive and untied their binds as quickly as possible. Recognizing each other, we nodded in mutual understanding we had no choice but to rely on each other if we were going to make it out alive. We wasted no time in stumbling through the forests, not daring to look back. Behind us, we could hear our captors regaining their composure and beginning their pursuit. Navigating through dense foliage was treacherous. Every misstep could mean life or death. After running for what felt like hours, we stumbled upon a rock wall and began scaling it as fast as we could. We didn't dare call for help lest our captors catch up with us first. As our pursuers grew closer, so did their menacing presence. We remained silent while attempting not to reveal our position on the rock face. They were steadfast in their pursuit, showing no signs of exhaustion or relenting. Their stench, a mixture of wet animal fur and dried blood, 
permeated through the air. It seemed that with each exhale they tasted our terror. Finally, we reached the summit of the rock wall, putting some distance between us and our pursuers. With ragged breaths and shaky limbs, we looked down, hoping they had lost sight of us. By some stroke of luck, they appeared to have difficulty scaling the wall and started to descend back into the forest. We remained still and silent until their grotesque forms vanished from sight. We didn't dare celebrate yet. Our respite was brief and survival was uncertain. I turned to my newfound ally their face a paradoxical blend of exhaustion and steely determination. We need to find help before they catch us again, I whispered. But who in this forest will help us? They responded with resignation. Just stay with me, I said, uncertainty tinging my words with a tremble. As we continued navigating through the perilous landscape, daylight began to fade. Trees loomed over us like monstrous figures reaching out to ensnare weary travelers. Nightfall would only heighten our disorientation and fear, but there was no choice other than pressing on. The forest gradually made way for a dilapidated road that had long been abandoned. We followed it toward the dim glow of distant headlights as a determination to survive cemented itself within us both. With every step closer to civilization, hope rekindled like a flame threatened by an encroaching storm. Finally, we stumbled into the nearest town in a state of exhaustion, covered in sweat and dirt. Collapsing on the pavement, we looked at each other with relief and apprehension. Though we had escaped the clutches of those mountain men for now, their looming presence would always haunt us. We silently vowed never to return to that forsaken forest even as other lost souls continued to stumble into its depths. The haunted memories were etched permanently into our minds, an inextinguishable reminder of the horrors that viciously lurked in those pristine mountains. In our shared experience, we forged an unbreakable bond, two survivors striving to grasp at the vestiges of normalcy. And as we appreciated our return to safety, we mourned the innocent lives lost to those gruesome mountain men and vowed to carry their memory with us forever. This happened to me about six months ago, back when I was taking a solitary hike in the Appalachian Mountains of West Virginia. I had always found solace in nature, and the peaceful quiet gave me an escape from the pressures of my job and recent divorce. My name is Harold Zumwalt, by the way, a simple man who loves his peace. During my hike, I met two fellow travelers, Clara Markowitz and Vincent Rappaport. We connected briefly over our shared interest in hiking and agreed to explore a less traveled route together. The trail looked promising, abundant with flora and lush green vegetation that blanketed the landscape. Despite being seasoned hikers, none of us had done any real research on the specific route we were taking. Our journey took us through dense forests, with twisted trees reaching for the sky. The terrain grew steeper and rockier. We laughed often, sharing jokes and stories as the sun dipped below the horizon painting the sky brilliant shades of orange and gold. As nightfall closed in around us, we made camp beside a babbling brook. Its soothing gurgles lulled us to sleep, at least until midnight, when I woke to strange noises echoing through the forest, unsettling rustling and snapping branches that sent shivers down my spine. I nudged Clara and Vincent awake. Something's off. I said quietly. Have either of you heard sounds like that before? They shook their heads. We decided to investigate together. As we crept closer to the sounds, we discovered deep tracks gouged into the earth, as if something heavy had been dragged along now partially illuminated by moonlight. We exchanged nervous glances but persisted in our pursuit. 
Our hearts hammered as we continued following the tracks until they led us straight to a cave entrance littered with jagged rocks ominously stained dark splotches which I chose not to think about too much. And that's when we saw them, hulking shapes, barely visible in the dim moonlight. Their towering, malnourished, and filthy bodies were covered in animal skins, their faces hidden behind primitive masks. There were at least five of them, but it was hard to tell for sure. Clara clamped her hand over her mouth to stifle a gasp, but it was too late. They had heard us and turned our way. Their eyes glinted hungrily. We sprinted back towards our campsite, desperation driving us forward as we scrambled over the terrain. I briefly considered calling for help but realized that no cell service was available this far into the wilderness. If we wanted to survive, we had to rely solely on our wits. We reached the campsite only to find that our packs had been torn open by wild animals attracted by the smell of food. The supplies that could have saved us were ruined. The cannibalistic mountain men hunted us relentlessly, laying traps waiting for the perfect moment to strike. We did our best to evade their pursuit. However, each day, they drew closer. Some nights we could hear their guttural voices just beyond the darkness that enveloped our hastily assembled hiding places. One night, as we rested under a canopy of leaves near a cliff's edge, Vincent whispered an idea. What if we create a diversion? Make it look like we've gone one way while slipping off in another direction? It was risky, but it seemed like our only hope. The next morning, Clara and I carefully laid a false trail veering south while Vincent kept watch up ahead. As evening approached, we snuck away from the ruse heading northward instead. But luck was not on our side. Our diversion had failed or they doubled back. Mid-action our trio faced an ambush near yet another dark cave entrance where two of the mountain men appeared to corner us. Truthfully we never had a chance. Vincent went down first, screaming as they mercilessly tore into him. Clara and I were paralyzed with fear as we watched the mountain men descend upon Vincent. A feeling of helplessness washed over me as their muscular, hairy bodies dismembered my friend. Their long, unruly hair and unkempt beards made it almost impossible to see their faces, not that I wanted to anyway. Remembering the cliff's edge behind us, I whispered to Clara, We have to jump. It's our only chance. There's no way, she replied in a trembling voice. It's either that or end up like Vincent, I said, the urgency in my voice evident. Clara hesitated for a moment, but as one of the mountain men turned his attentions towards us, she knew it was our only option. We leaped from the cliff's edge, hoping that the fall wouldn't kill us instantly. Miraculously, we survived. The cold water of a rushing river broke our fall. We struggled in the strong current and eventually found ourselves being swept downstream. The following days were a blur of exhaustion. We scavenged for food. The occasional berries and edible plants we found helped keep us alive. We knew we needed to find help, but each noise from the wilderness reminded us that those monstrous mountain men could still be pursuing us. Our desperation grew with each day until finally, we happened upon a ranger station by sheer luck. It almost felt too good to be true. Our journey through this hellish landscape could finally be over. I managed to stand in front of the ranger station door with Clara supporting me. My muscles ached from exhaustion and pain as I knocked feebly on the wooden door. Please! We need help! I yelled in between gasps for air. A tall man with short gray hair opened the door cautiously. What happened? I tried to speak, but tears filled my eyes as memories of Vincent and our ordeal came flooding back. Clara spoke up instead. We were attacked by, by, I don't know, some mountain men. 
They killed our friend and we barely escaped. Please, we have been out here for days. We just want to go home. The ranger eyed us with a mix of suspicion and pity before allowing us inside. He offered us water and dry clothes before making a call for help on his walkie-talkie. It wasn't long before other rangers appeared, whisking us off to medical staff that treated our wounds and fed us a proper meal. We told them about Vincent, despite struggling to revisit the horrors we experienced. They promised they would search for him, or at least recover his body. A few days later, we were transported back to civilization. As I sat in the back seat of the car that took us away from those dreadful woods, I couldn't help but think about Vincent, his bravery in the face of those bloodthirsty mountain men, and the price he paid trying to save me and Clara. It was difficult to accept that we were the only survivors of our weekend getaway. But as I glanced at Clara, I saw the newfound strength in her eyes despite her body still recovering from all that we had endured. We had been through an unimaginable nightmare, surviving against all odds when hope was but a flicker in the dark wilderness. As we left that cursed place behind, I knew that our lives would never be the same again, but Vincent's sacrifice would always be a reminder of what it meant to stand against evil in its most primal form. I made a silent promise to always carry his memory with me as I regained my life beyond those treacherous mountains. Vincent would not be forgotten, and neither would our story. This happened to me a couple of summers ago, before we moved away from Stony Hollow, a small town nested in the Appalachian Mountains. My name is Colin Keaton, and although I'm an office worker now, I used to be quite the hiker. At the time, my best friend Keynes and I were planning an outdoor adventure. An unexpected call interrupted us. It was Luca Menden, who had been searching for his cousin, Nolan Pickford. Nolan vanished into the mountains a week prior. It struck us as odd that someone would venture so deep into those shady woods. Luca needed our assistance. He gathered a group including Keynes and me, along with Weldon Velasco and Elda Stillsbury. Elda specialized in tracking and wilderness survival, while Weldon was skilled with firearms. United by our common concern for Nolan's safety, we embarked on an arduous search. As we penetrated deeper into the woods, we became increasingly skeptical of Nolan's decision to wander off on his own. Scattered remnants of abandoned camps lay around us as tangible reminders of past tragedies. As the air grew heavier with each step further into this forbidding territory, we decided to stop for the night. Huddled around our makeshift campfire, Elda told us about her childhood, growing up just beyond these ominous hills. She recalled stories showing how people had come to this place seeking solace only to endure horrors beyond description. When dawn finally arrived after a sleepless night listening to guttural whispers in the wind, we stumbled upon something truly gruesome. Lifeless eyes stared back at us from Nolan's severed head impaled on a jagged tree branch. Weeping over our fallen friend while panicked with disgust, we realized that others were stalking deep within these bewitched forests, mountain men with devious intentions and cannibalistic desires. Fear gripped our hearts as we pondered the fate of the countless lost souls who traversed before us. We knew we must alert the authorities but our phones had no signal. Left in a desperate situation, with no other viable options, we elected to persevere, determined to uncover the truth behind these odd occurrences. Trudging through the forest, we skirted razor-sharp rocks and steep ravines where any injudicious step could lead to certain doom. Suddenly, Weldon interrupted our thoughts. His gruff voice shook as he whispered, Get down! We pressed ourselves against the ground and watched as figures emerged from the thick foliage. 
The men had disheveled hair and wore tattered clothing that displayed layers of cake dirt. Their robust bodies bore countless scars gathered from vicious encounters. From their belts hung an assortment of rusty knives and other cruel instruments. Our group remained hidden behind an outcropping while Weldon aimed his rifle toward the approaching menace. A tense moment passed as we waited with bated breath. When they seemed close enough, Weldon took a shot, one of them crumpled to the ground, and chaos erupted. Swarming around their fallen companion like rabid animals, these deviants tore at his flesh greedily consuming it even as blood pooled around their knees. Repulsed by this sickening scene, Luca suddenly burst into hysterical laughter before succumbing to tears. As distressing emotion surged among us, Keynes leaned over to me and nervously whispered, Cullen, what if they knew Nolan? Are they friends? I shook my head solemnly in response. Understanding dawned upon us that these deviants were ultimately responsible for his demise. Knowing that these cannibals were the cause of Nolan's death, we realized we had to escape and call for help. We couldn't rely on our phones, which lost reception in this remote area. Additionally, the fact that we were alone and outnumbered by these ruthless beings made it all the more difficult to confront them. The cannibals continued consuming their fallen companion, leaving us with a small window of opportunity to sneak away. We scoped out the area and found an old dirt path that seemed to lead down the mountain. We crept silently through the foliage, trying not to alert our enemies. On occasion they'd look up from their grisly feast and scan their surroundings, presumably searching for intruders like us. As we traveled deeper into the forest, it became clear that these mountain men had been prowling this territory for some time. Guttural growls echoed through the trees as we spotted crude traps strewn across our path, dangerous mechanisms designed to ensnare unsuspecting animals or humans. Soon enough, fatigue began to take its toll on our group along with mental exhaustion from witnessing such horrors. We desperately needed some form of shelter or a safe haven where we could regain our strength and perhaps find a means of contacting authorities. The faint sound of running water caught our attention. We followed it in hopes of finding either a fresh water source or even a ranger's station. As we approached a fast-flowing river, there stood a decrepit wooden cabin nearby. Entering cautiously, we inspected the surrounding area for signs of recent human activity or any indication that cannibals frequented this place. The cabin appeared abandoned, allowing us to briefly rest without fear of imminent danger. We knew there was no time to linger. Those cannibals would eventually notice our escape. Determined not only to save ourselves but also prevent more innocent lives from falling victim to these madmen, we brainstormed our next move. I recalled passing a sign for a ranger station only a few miles before our initial encounter with the mountain men. If we mustered enough energy to travel that distance, help would be within reach. We forged ahead, driven by the desire to escape the clutches of this remote mountain and those who inhabited it. Our progress was hindered by cryptic markings etched onto trees, symbols made by the cannibals to communicate with each other. We feared they might be tracking us but vowed not to let fear dictate our actions. Tired and dehydrated but motivated to prevail, we finally arrived at the ranger's station. Its modest size belied its capacity to save us. We frantically knocked on the door, not knowing what we'd find on the other side. A park ranger greeted us warily, quickly gauging our disheveled state. We explained our encounter with the cannibals and pleaded for help. The ranger listened somberly as he offered assistance, providing first aid and contacting local law enforcement on our behalf. Soon enough, authorities swarmed the area in search of these mountain men responsible for Nolan's death and unspeakable acts committed against countless others. 
It never occurred to us that such horror could unfold so close to civilization, but now we knew otherwise. While we mourned Nalan and struggled to process the ordeal we had survived, justice was sought on his behalf and for every other unfortunate soul who crossed paths with those cannibals. The world would never be the same after witnessing such atrocities perpetrated by fellow humans in this remote corner of civilization. But for every dark deed uncovered in this world, such as those committed by these depraved individuals, there also arise stories of resilience and unity among strangers as compelling as ours. Though we had lost a friend in Nalan, his memory fueled our determination to ensure that no one else falls victim to the horrors of this mountain. This happened to me a couple of summers ago in Pecos National Forest, New Mexico. My name is Noah Fitzsimmons, and I had just graduated college. I needed an escape, somewhere peaceful to clear my mind before starting a new job. There I was, setting up camp with my friends Gideon Rasmussen and Delilah Redgrove. We cracked jokes while tightening our tents, unaware that our real challenges were yet to come. As evening turned into night, we settled around the campfire, and the stories flowed along with laughter. Suddenly, a scream interrupted us. In the distance, it echoed with growing dread. The forest fell silent, birds ceased singing, crickets stopped chirping. What was that? Delilah asked, her voice shaking. We're not waiting here to find out. Gideon replied as he grabbed a flashlight from his backpack. We cautiously made our way through the trees towards the source of the terrifying scream. A mile away from our campsite we discovered an abandoned vehicle, its windshield shattered and crimson stains splattered across the seats. Our uneasiness increased by the second until we heard sounds of panic-stricken whispers further up ahead. As we approached, we saw a couple huddled near each other, Peter Llewellyn and Emma O'Reilly, faces covered in slashes and blood staining their clothes. We need your help. Name a whimpered between gasps of air. Our friends, they've been taken by mountain men. She paused as Peter cut in. Cannibals. The terror in their eyes made it difficult for any of us to scoff at or doubt their words. So we agreed to assist them in finding their missing friends before calling for help since we lost cell phones signal deep into the woods. We traveled deeper into Pecos National Forest following Peter and Emma's recollection of their encounter with the mountain men. The sun began to set, turning the orange skies into shades darker than our fears. Gideon carried the rifle his father had given him. I held a knife I had once deemed unnecessary for our camping trip. With each step, we searched for clues of the cannibal's whereabouts, broken branches, blood stains, or footprints. We knew we entered their territory when we discovered a decrepit shack surrounded by an eerie silence. As we mustered the courage to open its door, it creaked ominously, revealing its dark and unwelcoming interior. Peter stepped in first and instantly screamed. He stumbled out, vomiting at the sight before us human limbs lying in bloody heaps while mutilated faces stared blankly at the ceiling. Peter gasped between cries. It's them. They're all dead. The terror consuming us only intensified as we heard guttural growls from outside the shack. Gideon pulled Naima out of the cabin just as a massive hand swiped at her chest. There they stood, grisly shapes of mountain men, skin stretched taut over bones that jutted at unnatural angles. Their leader stood out. His height dwarfed the others while scars crisscrossed his face like a grisly road map of violence. He bared his teeth, blood-stained and hungry for more victims. Our minds numbed with terror. We fought against these vicious monsters desperately knowing that surrender meant becoming their next meal. 
Deafening shots rang from Gideon's rifle as I wrestled with one of them using my knife to slash at its throat. Delilah grabbed a flaming log from a nearby fire they had been using to roast their captive's remains and tossed it at them. The blazing embers successfully distracted some of them, while Delilah managed to overcome her fears and helped us subdue another cannibal. But as we braced ourselves for another strike, the leader lunged at Gideon, sinking his teeth deep into his neck. Gideon panicked and the rifle flew from his grasp, while the enormous figure chewed on our friend with sickening satisfaction. Despair settled in as I scrambled to grab the rifle. So, you think you can save them? The mountain man leader growled at me, amusement glittering in his cruel eyes. I stared him down, my grip tightening on the rifle. I knew I couldn't save Gideon, but I could at least try to protect the others. The mountain man leader released Gideon's now limp body and prepared for his next attack. Run! I yelled to Delilah and Naima. Get out of here and find help! Understanding the urgency, they sprinted away from the scene, disappearing into the forest. I couldn't call for help myself. My priority was holding off these monsters. The mountain man leader charged at me with a snarl, but I fired the rifle in his direction. A bullet pierced his shoulder, and he staggered back with a pained growl. The recoil from the shot jarred my arm, but I quickly lined up another shot as two more cannibals approached. With precise aim, I managed to wound a second cannibal. They backed off momentarily, unsure how to handle their newfound vulnerability. The opportunity allowed me to grab Gideon's lifeless body and start moving toward the woods. It wasn't easy. Every step sent a jolt of pain through my arms, but there was no way I could leave him behind. Unable to take any more, the cannibal leader unleashed a furious roar that rumbled through the valley. He mustered all his strength and charged again, blood dripping from his shoulder wound. It was brutal and determined, testament to his gruesome reputation. Sensing that running wouldn't be enough to keep them at bay indefinitely, I paused under an overhang of boulders near the tree lean and propped Gideon against a nearby tree trunk. Then, with shaky hands, loaded one last bullet into the rifle. My options were limited and time was running out. The mountain man leader was close now, too close for comfort, so I made one final attempt to hold him off. As he descended upon me, I braced myself and fired the last bullet. It struck his chest, but he barely flinched. In a swift motion, he swiped at me with his blood-soaked hands. I managed to dodge the deadly grass but stumbled and fell, hitting my head on a rock. Darkness started clouding my vision. I could feel the cold tendrils of unconsciousness creeping in. This was it, I thought as my focus faded. I'll die here, just like Gideon. But then an ear-splitting blast erupted from the mountainside. The entire landscape shook violently throwing dirt and debris in every direction, including onto the cannibals who were momentarily disoriented. It was just enough time for me to drag myself back under the overhang. Emerging from the trees were Delilah and Naima, having returned just in time after finding help from a distant cabin within the forest. Their rescuers had arrived with dynamite meant for clearing obstacles during hikes and now to be used against our attackers. In a desperate race against time, the pack of cannibals snapping at their heels, they'd managed to plant sticks of explosives along their path back to us. The resulting detonations caused a cascade of rock slides that moved through the forest, engulfing several cannibals caught off guard. The mountain man leader survived, however, Enraged and full of murderous intent toward us, he began his pursuit despite gaping wounds and blood loss. Delilah and Naima had just made it back when armed rescue men appeared out of nowhere in response to their pleas for help. 
With their arrival began a showdown on our makeshift battlefield beneath the boulders. Together we fought through our exhaustion as gunfire echoed through the valley, a testament to human survival against these relentless foes. The mountain man leader finally fell after several well-placed shots penetrated his skull like a fractured mosaic. Demoralized and injured, the remaining cannibals ceased their assault. Left standing amidst the carnage, we cradled Gideon's body between us as things settled down. With this tragic loss at the forefront of our hearts, we made a new resolve to warn any others who might wander into these mountains. The gruesome encounter that forever scarred our lives would be remembered, so that no one would ever take a wrong turn into cannibal territory again. This happened to me a few summers ago. My friend, Walter Severs, and I decided to go on a hiking trip in the vast forests of Oregon. It was meant to be one last adventure before settling into our mundane jobs. The first two days went smoothly. One evening, while cooking some beans at our campsite, I remember talking with Walter about his wife and how he dreamt of better days soon. Just then, we heard rustling nearby and saw a tall figure in the distance, but shrugged it off as it disappeared as quickly as it came. The next day, we met Mara Kolesnik, another hiker who mentioned she couldn't find her way back to her group. After hearing her story, we agreed that she'd stay with us until morning. We sat by the fire sharing some good banter and laughter over life's peculiarities. As dawn broke, we stumbled upon one of the most gruesome things I'd ever seen. Several bodies were mutilated along the trail. Frozen in shock, Walter whispered, We should turn back and inform the authorities. However, Mara refused to go back without her friends. Too deep into unfamiliar territory but unable to abandon Mara's dilemma, we kept going against our better judgment. Walking silently through the hauntingly beautiful landscape, Walter leading the way, we cautiously explored abandoned cabins and noticed shadows lurking behind trees. What do you think is going on? Mara asked anxiously. Small chance it's wildlife predation, I whispered, my skepticism rising. But by the looks of it, it doesn't add up. We finally discovered an isolated waterfall hiding in the wilderness. Next to it was Alice Drestenke tied to a tree Mara's closest friend bruised around the eyes and unconscious. We frantically cut her free and asked what had happened. Before Alice could reply, she weakly pointed behind us towards the eerie woods and whispered, Them. Suddenly, heavy footsteps and whispers emerged. The footsteps were deliberately spaced to make a calculated approach while the whispers hinted at a gleeful satisfaction in our predicament. Walter nudged Mara to hide behind a nearby rock. We got ready with our guns and knives, straining our eyes to make out anything useful in the rapidly waning light. The three looming figures crept closer and closer, showing no fear. Walter silently swore under his breath which is odd for he usually took things in stride. The first figure approached us from behind a bush, and its appearance was nothing short of horrifying, a large man wearing animal skins, his eyes wild and hair matted, almost like a human beast. His companions appeared from the tree line one slender form wielding firearms and another brutish hulk heaving a large mallet. They began to circle us like hungry predators waiting for the perfect moment to strike. Our hearts pounding, we formed a tight circle defensively waiting for something, anything. When they made their move, we fought back with everything we had. We had no choice but to retaliate and try to make sense of this nightmare. All of a sudden, Alice let out an agonizing scream. Swift as an arrow, an unseen assailant dragged her towards the darkness. 
We tried grabbing hold of her hands reaching out but hopeless against the assailant's relentless pull. In that moment, we had to make a choice. I glanced at Walter and Mara, and without speaking a word, our decision was unanimous. We had to save Alice. We lunged towards her, trying to gain the upper hand on her attacker. As we got closer, we could see that the person responsible for dragging Alice away was another member of the cannibalistic mountain men. He was wearing tattered clothes with patches of dried blood all over them. His nails were long and sharp like claws. It was terrifying to look at him, but we couldn't afford to let fear take over. Walter grabbed a large branch from the ground and charged at the mountain man holding Alice. He swung it with every ounce of strength he had, connecting with the side of the guy's head. The assailant staggered and released his grip on Alice, who fell limply onto the ground. I quickly pulled Alice towards us as Mara took charge and tried to fend off two more aggressive mountain men headed in our direction. She used her knife expertly but struggled against their overwhelming strength. These men were much bigger than any normal human being. Walter decided that it was time to call for help since we were no match for these terrifying figures who had appeared from nowhere. He took out his phone and dialed 911 as fast as he could while simultaneously keeping an eye out for any movement from our assailants. The 911 operator picked up immediately, and Walter tried to explain where we were, that we were in those eerie woods being attacked by a group of savage-looking mountain men. However, his voice trembled as he attempted to provide more specific details about our location. It seemed like forever as each minute dragged on while Walter stayed on the line with the emergency dispatcher. The fact that we had no idea if help would arrive in time only escalated our anxiety. The mountain men continued their relentless pursuit, showing no signs of slowing down or giving up. We had no choice but to keep moving and try to stay one step ahead of them. Our hearts raced as we struggled to keep up, leaving us strained and gasping for air. As the hours went by, we eventually managed to escape their clutches and found a safe place to hide. Walter stayed on the line with the operator, ensuring that help was on its way. Finally, we saw the first signs of rescue, red and blue flashing lights slicing through the darkness. With our hearts pounding in our ears from adrenaline and exhaustion, we came out of hiding and approached the police officers who rushed to our aid. They encircled us protectively, keeping a wary eye on the woods as they radioed for additional support. Surprisingly, it wasn't long before they apprehended the mountain men responsible for Alice's near demise. The grisly sight of these animalistic figures being detained by police was strangely satisfying yet harrowing at the same time. Once the ordeal was over and our attackers were behind bars, we found ourselves reeling from everything that happened. We took some comfort in knowing that these vicious mountain men would never again be able to terrorize anyone else. Days turned into weeks, and our lives began to return to normalcy. Yet what happened in those woods still haunted us. Every time we closed our eyes at night, we could see their wild expressions or hear their whispers approach like ghosts in the night. Walter lamented about what could have happened if he hadn't decided to call for help that night. Our swift, rational decision had saved Alice and likely ourselves from a terrible fate. Alice hesitantly embarked on her journey towards recovery from her close encounter with death. We supported her through therapy sessions kept a close watch over her emotional health, and reminded her every day that she wasn't alone in this battle. Walter, Mara, and I would always be by her side. What transpired during that ordeal became a stark lesson for the four of us. As strange as it may sound, it brought us closer together, cementing our bond. We overcame fear and faced a nightmarish reality head-on. Life would never be the same again but at least we had each other to lean on in the face of life's darkest moments.
This happened to me a few weeks ago when I decided to head out to the Pocono Mountains for a much-needed break from city life. My name's Zach Silverstein, and I work as a software engineer. I was driving along a scenic route when I realized I must have taken a wrong turn somewhere. Losing my only map to wind added to the mess of navigating through the confusing network of narrow roads. The sun was going down before I knew it, and I found myself stranded in front of an abandoned house nestled deep in the woods. As time went on, becoming more desperate, I knocked on the door, hoping someone could help me find my way back. While waiting, I overheard a conversation between two men named Herb and Reuben, discussing their latest hunting endeavors. Reuben's voice chilled my bones as he described disemboweling their latest catch with unnerving enthusiasm. My curiosity getting the better of me, I followed the voices to their origin and stumbled upon something horrifying, a small firelit clearing filled with human remains. The men noticed me and bolted towards me, bloodied weapons in hand. My heart raced as I sprinted back to my car barely making it inside before the cannibalistic mountain men reached me. They pounded relentlessly on my windows as I started the engine and threw it into reverse. The lament of Herb and Reuben's angry screams behind me was enough to understand these were no ordinary hunters. Somehow connected with multiple missing persons cases from our area over decades is what brought them together. As days turned into dreadful weeks— I became increasingly paranoid never knowing if they would catch up or if another poor jolt would take my place. That fear escalated when I heard about other victims' gruesome fates that befell those who had gotten lost in these hills. One night at a local diner, a group of fellow survivors huddled together sharing terrifying stories of our brushes with these monstrous men. It was surreal to realize we were unintentionally linked by this horrific thread. Our collective traumas bound us tighter, creating a support network in which we shared prayers and inside jokes. Tired of living in fear, a plan began to form an attempt at vengeance on the criminals that mercilessly destroyed lives. We would confront the cannibalistic mountain men in their territory and gather enough evidence to prosecute them to the fullest extent of the law. As we set out, I couldn't help thinking about the strange series of events that led me here. It was hard to shake off the coalescing dread that permeated the air. The further we advanced, the heavier it felt as if walking through molasses. Our careful steps carved out a grim pathway between tangled roots and gnarled underbrush. Amidst our journey, I spotted something chilling a tree festooned with grisly trophies seemingly taken from each victim a finger here, a golden locket there. We exchanged uneasy glances, knowing those very items might belong to loved ones whose lives were viciously snuffed out by these sadistic men. Emboldened by their morbid display, our resolve hardened. Suddenly, gunshots echoed through the forest like a thunderstorm my worst nightmare materializing before our eyes my heart leaped into my throat as i struggled to remove myself from capture and certain death at least three members of our group were down herb frantically reloading while reuben licked his lips in anticipation everything seemed hopeless I could feel time slipping away like sand through fingertips as we darted for cover behind bushes and trees in an attempt to blend with nature itself. As we cowered behind trees, I contemplated calling for help. Unfortunately, our remote location made it impossible for a distress signal to get through. That realization only amplified the dread that had found a home in my heart. The gunshots seemed to come from every direction, making it impossible to discern where the mountain men were lurking. Then, out of nowhere, I spotted one of them charging toward us. He was a colossal figure with unkempt hair and dirty, ragged clothing that hung off his exposed, muscular arms and worn torso. Lurking in the shadows, 
we watched this monstrous attacker as he sliced through the air with his machete like a sickle through wheat. He grabbed one of our fallen comrades and began to maul him with insatiable ferocity. At that moment, I understood that these mountain men embody pure evil, being synonymous with carnage and devastation. Herb managed to reload his gun and fired at the approaching maniac. To our horror, the shot had little effect on him. It only intensified his bloodlust as he set after us again. We ran deeper into the forest, hoping some distance would put us out of immediate danger. The dense undergrowth provided more cover but also made it difficult to traverse quickly. As we struggled to navigate through this treacherous terrain, Reuben decided we should split up in an attempt to throw off our pursuers. Reluctantly agreeing with this desperate plan, we dispersed throughout the woods, fearful for both ourselves and our friends. We knew that if captured by those mountain men, death was far from the worst fate that awaited us. While darting from tree to tree, I could hear my heartbeat thundering in my ears in harmony with the rhythmic gunshots chasing me through this damned forest. My rapidly failing stamina finally yielded, and I collapsed onto the ground, desperate to catch my breath regardless of the risk attendant to stopping. The shrieks and gunshots suddenly ceased, yielding silence that was somehow more harrowing than the cacophony of moments before. Reluctantly, I emerged from my hiding spot, hoping against all hope that this was over. While cautiously advancing through the woods, I stumbled upon another grisly scene, Reuben and Herb's bodies, a testament to the brutality of the savage mountain men. Feeling panic sweep through me, I sprinted as fast as I could, knowing I couldn't stop again. Finally, having regained some composure, I saw ahead of me an old ranger station desolate but seemingly untouched by the malevolence lurking in these woods. Heart pounding, I burst through the door and began searching frantically for a radio or map, anything that might help me escape or contact help. Triumph surged through me when I spotted an old two-way radio on a dusty desk. Hastily grabbing it, I attempted to call for help, praying someone would pick up. Thankfully, a response came crackling through. This is Highway Patrol, what's your emergency? Gasping for breath, I hastily relayed my predicament and urged them to send help immediately. As they tried to determine my location and send backup, gunshots rang out once again, announcing that my pursuit had resumed. Defeated by exhaustion and fear, I barricaded myself inside the station as best as I could and waited. Time seemed to stretch endlessly as adrenaline coursed through my veins turning minutes into hours in this terrifying haze. Finally, after what felt like an eternity of violence punctuated by absolute silence, sirens cut through the darkness. The piercing wail heralded rescuers racing toward us. I could hear the confused shouting of our assailants as they tried to flee from law enforcement officers embroiled in this deadly confrontation. The climactic battle between good and evil played out before my eyes as flashes of gunfire illuminated the forest. When the dust finally began to settle, those monstrous men were apprehended and taken into custody. Most importantly, I was free, but broken by the appalling ordeal that had robbed me of my friends. United in grief under this horrifying experience, we survivors gathered to remember our fallen comrades, Reuben and Herb, whose tragic sacrifice weighed heavily on our souls as we mourned their passing and tried to make sense of the senseless violence. In quiet remembrance, we whispered final goodbyes, hoping that together we could find a way to heal from this unimaginable trauma. This happened to me about a decade ago, while on a road trip with my friend Anders in California. We decided to explore the Sierra National Forest in our jeep, 
not realizing we were embarking on something horrifying. Driving through the trees, we admired the stunning scenery. A cozy diner near our cabin served us delicious homemade pie for dessert, indicating that this was meant to be a fun trip. I remember casually revealing that I had always been an only child and often sought adventures to fill my days. The next morning, Anders and I ventured off the beaten path, excited about discovering hidden gems in the vast wilderness. Several miles into the forest, we stumbled upon an abandoned campsite. Eerie vibes swirled as we noticed shredded tents and scattered belongings, including torn clothes stained with dried blood. Feeling uneasy, we decided to push further into the forest but found ourselves being watched by a ragged man with piercing eyes and matted hair hidden in the shadows. We began to hike faster, hearts hammering in our chests. Suddenly, another stranger appeared before us, even more grotesque than the first one, brandishing a blood-soaked hatchet. It became evident that they were part of a larger group when eerie whistling echoed around us. We tried to call for help, but there was no signal deep in this wilderness. Fear surged like adrenaline as Anders and I sprinted away from our pursuers, desperate to escape from these evil mountain dwellers. Shadows shifted among them while they tortured unsuspecting travelers passing through their domain. Breathing heavily and covered in sweat, we managed to lose them briefly before stumbling upon a macabre sight. Human bones arranged like surreal decorations adorned tree branches while skulls gazed sightlessly into the never-ending darkness of the forest. The evidence of horror became increasingly obvious as we realized that escape might not be easy. Clutching whatever makeshift weapons we could find, we tried to form a plan, noticing primitive traps scattered throughout the area. They were relentless in their pursuit, enjoying the sinister game of cat and mouse they had created for us. Cries in the distance signaled further victims captured by these savages, strengthening our resolve to escape their grasp. Time was running out, and as exhaustion threatened to overwhelm us, we knew it was now or never. Summoning our courage, we made our stand against this group of sadistic mountain men. Grappling with one of them, I looked into his wild eyes and saw pure malevolence consuming him. The fight became fierce as Anders cried out in pain, fresh blood staining his clothes. We fought tooth and nail against these monstrous beings who reveled in a life of violence and cruelty. Our once simple road trip had devolved into a desperate battle for survival. Our assailants were like hungry predators eager to claim their prey in grisly fashion. Facing such unspeakable horrors, no time left for humor or light conversations pleading screams filled the air as our fellow travelers suffered at the hands of these degenerate beings. We knew they wouldn't stop until every last one of us was mangled beyond recognition or worse. As I dashed through the trees towards an injured Anders, a hand grasped my ankle, slamming me into the ground hard enough to knock any rational thought from my head. I couldn't help but wonder if any place in this forest would ever be safe again with these cannibals lurking in the shadows, seeking human flesh with dark abandon. Our situation desperate and time slipping away, we fought with all our might against our sworn adversaries. The frantic struggle intensified as we realized that this could be our final battle against these deadly hunters who had already claimed so many victims. In the midst of this brutal confrontation, I realized that calling for help would do no good. We were deep in the heart of this cannibalistic territory, and none of us knew our exact location. Even if we managed to find some cell service, it seemed unlikely that anyone could reach us in time to make a difference. Our only hope was to work together and fend off these twisted mountain men long enough to escape. One of the cannibals swung an axe, barely missing my head as I ducked just in time. The sharp blade lodged itself into a nearby tree trunk, 
temporarily incapacitating him. Another assailant leaped forward, brandishing a rusty chain he swung menacingly in our direction. The savage attackers were grotesque-looking men with unwashed hair and wearing filthy clothes made from animal skins. Their wiry beards were caked with dried blood, betraying their gruesome appetites. Their eyes burned with hunger and rage as they bared discolored teeth like feral animals. We had no choice but to defend ourselves. Our makeshift weapons consisted of rocks, sticks, and anything else we could find on the forest floor. We fought in pairs to protect each other's backs, an unspoken pact of solidarity forged by sheer terror. I teamed up with Anders, who had already sustained injuries but was still determined to fight for his life. He was covered in cuts and bruises but managed to keep going despite his pain. Together we worked in tandem to fend off these monstrous beings that roamed the wilderness. Our fellow travelers were engaged in similar battles around us, each person doing their best to repel the brutal onslaught from these cannibalistic hunters. I could see fear etched onto everyone's faces, but there was also a fierce determination not to become the next meal for these vile creatures. Somehow, against all odds, we began making progress towards escape. Fighting back to back, we managed to force our way through the cannibals. We made a run back towards the path we had wandered off from, never imagining that taking a wrong turn would have brought us face to face with this nightmare. As we headed deeper into the forest, tracked by our relentless foes, a few of our group fell prey to the cannibals. Screams of pain and fear echoed through the air as they were brutally attacked and killed, their blood offering a horrifying contrast to the verdant greenery that surrounded us. Though we didn't have time to grieve for them, their deaths weighed heavily on all of us as we tried to survive. Fear gripped us, urging us to keep going even when our bodies threatened to give in to exhaustion. We knew there was no other option but to press on, putting distance between ourselves and these inhuman monsters. When daylight finally broke over the horizon, it seemed like nothing short of a miracle. The night had been seemingly endless, but at last salvation appeared in the form of rescue helicopters hovering above. They had spotted our desperate smoke signals and arrived just as hope was beginning to dwindle. The remaining cannibals slunk back into the shadows, vanishing without a trace. Whether they feared being discovered or understood that their prey had been snatched from their grasp was unclear. But one thing was certain, they were still out there somewhere. Our unexpected encounter with these sadistic mountain men left deep scars, both physical and mental, on all of those who managed to survive. As we were lifted away from the grisly sight of our battle for life, I felt a mixture of relief and dread knowing that those despicable creatures still roamed free. But as we rose higher into the sky and away from this nightmarish ordeal, another thought found its way through my shattered mind. Out there somewhere, there would be other weary travelers unknowingly taking a wrong turn, just like we had, and sealing their terrible fate. And until these monstrous beings were stopped, the terror would go on. 